Now I'm going to I'm going to talk about our experiences dealing with atmospheric gravity waves, um, both spurious and real. I can buy wallet with the mala or headphone then. Sure, yeah, I got salamopa. If you're in the audience, please mute your microphone, please. Okay. Um, you'll see, I'll, abbrevi I'll abbreviate atmospheric gravity waves, AGW, in places in these slides. But atmospheric gravity waves are um, three dimensional internal waves that form in stably stratified regions of the atmosphere. Um, they're, they're kind of like three, three dimensional form of ripples on a pond. Um, something has to trigger them, some sort of vertical disturbance. It can be complex terrain, thunderstorms, frontal passages, or even there's growing thought that wind farms might trigger gravity waves. <clears throat> and I have a couple of pictures here. The animated picture is gravity waves as visualized with clouds that are sloshing up and down with the gravity waves. Um, the lower picture, that shows potential temperature profiles, some from data from some, the dark one, the solid lines ideal. But once you get up above the atmospheric boundary layer, generally, generally you have stable stratification and gravity waves will want to form up there. Why are, why are they important? Why are we spending time trying to understand how to include them in our simulations? Well, we think that wind plants can act as a disturbance. Um, they, can, they can then trigger atmospheric gravity waves. And then those gravity waves modify the flow and feedback to the wind, wind farm and change the, change the performance from what is predicted. Um, they might be an important component of this idea of wind plant blockage. Here are a couple images from the work of Dries Alerts and Johan Myers. Um, they did large eddy simulations of wind farms with atmospheric gravity waves above. The wind farm triggers the gravity waves. This picture on the right, it's a vertical slice of the streamwise velocity through a wind farm. Down near the bottom, you can see the, the boundary layer of the wind farm, all the wakes and everything. It's a time average picture. But then up, up above it, you can see these, these atmospheric gravity waves and particularly at the head of the wind farm, you see a, a blue region, which means the flow has been slowed down. So that's an interesting thing. Um, even if wind farms don't trigger gravity waves, Wind farms can be complex, could, can be situated in complex terrain where there are gravity waves, like what Bronco showed yesterday in the east of the Cascades. Um, so being able to capture those is important if you're trying to do these complex simulations with all, all these physics. What got us started on this was a simulation in the, the Big Low Canyon area where we were trying to feed in. Um, Wharf generated inflow into a standalone large eddy simulation domain of a really somewhat, somewhat localized region where um, there happen to be wind farms. And when we simulate it, this is a, this is a contour 100 meters above the surface, 120 meters above the surface. Um, this is stream. Streamwise velocity or velocity in the east-west direction. We got these recirculation bubbles. We couldn't figure what was going on, and we then figured out that gravity waves were forming in the simulation, interacting with the boundaries and becoming way too amplified, um, becoming spurious, and creating these separation bubbles. Um, Spurious versus physical. 
atmospheric gravity waves are really there in the real atmosphere. So you may do a simulation with something like a hill in it, and you might trigger real gravity waves in your, your code. If it includes buoyancy, we'll, we'll capture gravity waves. Um, but your code also could have numerical things in it that act as triggers and create spurious gravity waves, or the real gravity waves can bounce off domain boundaries. Um, so if you bring stratification into your simulations and your simulation domain is big enough, expect to have to deal with gravity waves. Um, here's, a, here's a picture of a, a really simple case that we use to kind of study things where the flow is from left to right. Okay. The flow is from left to right. There's a really small 100 meter tall hill in the center of the domain that acts as a trigger. The flow is, the, the temperature is stably stratified and you get gravity waves. The top picture is an analytical solution of what, what these gravity waves should look like from linearized flow theory. The bottom is what it looks like if you do CFD with no special treatment and the, the waves bounce off the domain boundaries and create a real mess. Here's another example. These ones, you know, are they physical or spurious? We're not sure in this case. This was from um, work on a NYSERDA project where we were simulating a wind farm of 35 15 megawatt turbines. Here's a, here's a couple of vertical slices through one row of the wind farm. And it was very stably stratified in a layer down near the turbines. And the turbines created gravity waves just in a very thin layer above the, the wind farm. Now, we didn't do a lot of special treatment for gravity waves here. So they, they likely bounce off the boundaries and are not quite how they should be in nature, but it, it gets you thinking, does this actually happen in, in real wind farms under the right situations? Um, so what, 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 you know, in the beginning when we started doing wind plant simulations before we did mesomicrocoupling, we just did these canonical ABLs and then put wind turbines in there um, and did large eddy simulation of the wind farm. And we never had gravity wave problems, even though we had buoyancy. So when did it become a problem for us? Well, once we started making our domains larger, um, once we went, you know, domains that like what Regis was showing yesterday with a complex terrain, domains that were 10 kilometers tall to not create blockage over the terrain, um, longer simulation times, including terrain, um, non-canonical conditions, larger wind turbines, all these things seem to cause gravity waves to show up when we didn't necessarily see them before we had these features in our simulations. Here's just a picture of a tall domain case with with terrain that form gravity waves. So how do we, how do we figure out what to do about it? Um, well, working with the three dimensional large eddy simulations is really cumbersome. Um, so we have taken a step back and found that you can really, you can produce atmospheric gravity waves with really simplified cases. Um, they can be, 2D, something as simple as, as a big long domain that's tall, that has stable stratification, and then it has a step change in roughness at the surface will we'll create a vertical perturbation that will create gravity waves. And then you can try methods to, to treat the boundary waves at the domain boundary so they don't bounce off the boundaries and, and cause havoc on your simulations. Um, here, here's a, here's a nice example. <clears throat> that very first motivation picture I showed you of us trying to simulate the Bigelow Canyon wind farm area. Um, we've made a very simple 2D case that has no train. It just feeds in the, 
the velocity and the temperature profile that come from the wharf simulation of that, that time of interest, the same wharf data that we were feeding into the full 3D LES. Um, and we, we, can, we can recreate the problems we were having in the full 3D case where we get waves. And we can, you know, this is something that runs on 10 cores in five minutes. So we can try all sorts of things and, and really understand what are the triggers for the gravity waves. So our primary solution strategy has been Rayleigh damping. That's a common, common method to deal with gravity waves. Um, it's, it, it's nice because it's a, it's a really general idea. The idea is that you, you have an extra forcing term that pushes the solution in our case, the velocity field back to some desired state within some region of your flow. Um, the simplest way to think of that is up along the top boundary. You can have you can have a fringe region that extends below the top boundary with some thickness that creates a force that damps the vertical velocity to zero. But it, I, this can be completely general. You could have a region that forces the velocity back to some complex 3D time-varying, space-varying, turbulent flow. There are other ways to, to deal with gravity waves. There's wave transmissive boundaries. Um, and really damping has just been attractive to us because it is much simpler and seems more flexible and has more possibilities. This is Rayleigh damping illustrated. So you have a, you end up with a damping term in your momentum equations that is just some time constant um, multiplied by the difference between the actual velocity and the desired velocity that you're trying to force back towards. These regions also, it's not like you apply this forcing just full force throughout the region. Um, they smoothly ramp up to full force with a cosine function. So you can put these regions wherever you want, along all domain boundaries, however you want to do it. Um, there, there's some difficult problems with, with these simulations and, and Rayleigh damping that we're, we've worked a lot of the way through. Some are still open questions. Um, it requires space and time for the Rayleigh damping to, to damp waves to the desired state. So that means if you have a five kilometer thick damping region, you're going to need five kilometers of mesh that, um, where the solution's not really something that, it's a part of the solution you would throw out because it's just damping. So that incurs some cost. But can that, portion of the grid be really coarse. Um, what happens when gravity waves pass from fine to coarse? Does that pose a problem? This seems to be fine from what we're finding. A particular challenge is if, you, if you're trying to feed turbulent inflow into a domain and you want to put a Rayleigh damping layer on that inflow side, how do you allow the turbulent flow to come in without damping it out? Um, so, you know, we, we've worked through a lot of these things. We generally put damping on the top boundary. We put it on the inflow boundary, but we attenuate the damping before you get to the top of the boundary layer so that turbulence that you're feeding in either from some sort of precursor simulation or um, you know, maybe it's cell perturbation, something like that, that's allowed to pass through. And same thing on the outflow boundary. And we've been damping only the vertical velocity. But I think another challenge is we don't fully understand how thick to make the damping region and how strong to make the damping time constant. The thickness and the constant are related, but they also seem situation dependent. Um, here's an example of a, a nice little case where, where it does work. This 
this is a vertical slice through through a flow um, showing vertical velocity, instantaneous vertical velocity. So this is a tall domain, 15 kilometers tall, and there is it's it's a domain to study what happens at the land sea interface. So it's very idealized. Um, but you have a five kilometer long turbulence generating precursor section that creates the boundary layer. Um, and then that atmospheric boundary layer feeds into an inflow outflow domain that has a step change in roughness as if you're going from land to sea. And at that step change, the flow speeds up because it sees a lower roughness as it goes out over the sea. And that creates a, a bulk vertical flow and that acts as a trigger for gravity waves. And you can see the gravity waves in the background. They're very faint, but they're there. And without damping, they cause a real problem. But with Rayleigh damping on all sides, and with Rayleigh damping that attenuates before it gets to the atmospheric boundary layer on this side, um, the waves are really well behaved. A case where we don't have it well under control is still this Big Low Canyon case. I showed this movie earlier. Um, this is the very simplified version. And the interesting thing about this case is it's got a very complex vertical profile of velocity and temperature that comes out of warp. And there's strong, stable stratification. And for whatever reason, even with Rayleigh damping that we're, we're using here, Rayleigh damping helps, but even in a very simplified 2D case with no terrain, um, waves still, still form. And it, I think it has something to do with, you're going from a mesoscale compressible solver to an incompressible Boussin-esque standalone wind plant atmospheric LES. And something is out of adjustment, or something's out of balance and these waves form. And even with gravity wave damping, with Rayleigh damping, they're still there. Um, but without it, they're, they create circulation bubbles and all sorts of really bad stuff. So this is still a problem that we're working on. Um, and then another thing for thought is some researchers especially those who use pseudo spectral codes where the, the domain has to be periodic in the horizontal directions, they can do something that looks like an inflow outflow um, if they use the Fourier fringe method. And that's illustrated here below. You would have really two domains. You'd have one that is a precursor domain that creates the atmospheric boundary layer and it's horizontally homogeneous. There's no wind turbines or anything in it. And then you'd have an inflow outflow case. It's still periodic, but it has a fringe region downstream that forces whatever flow happened on the inside of this domain. For example, if you put wind turbine aerodynamics models in and you get wakes, well, those wakes will wash downstream. But within that fringe region, it forces the flow back to what happened in this precursor so that when it comes back through, it looks like turbulent flow from the precursor feeding back in. Um, and we don't, we don't see in these researchers work or talking to these researchers that they have as challenging gravity wave problems as we've encountered. They use, they use Rayleigh damping, but I think what's happening is the fringe region itself is a form of Rayleigh damping. So if gravity waves are propagating downstream, they hit the fringe region and are damped. If they're propagating upstream, well, this domain is periodic. So they, they also come back through and hit the fringe region and are damped. So we, we've been thinking, how can we use this idea and generalize it to the sorts of situations with complex terrain, general inflow outflow that we deal with in, in our wind plant work? Okay, to summarize, um, atmospheric gravity waves are real. They're in the real atmosphere. They'll show up in your simulations if you have stable stratification and you've got tall enough domains. Um, there's growing thought that wind farms trigger atmospheric gravity waves and then they impact the performance. So there is, there's a real 
need to be able to simulate these things realistically. But as I showed, they can interact with domain boundaries, bounce off of boundaries, and then amplify in really spurious ways. We found that Rayleigh damping is the most robust tool for, for treatment of gravity wave domain boundary interactions. Um, we like it because it's so flexible and can take so many different forms, but we're still searching for how do we, how do we apply it in the most robust way for these really generalized cases with mesoscale forcing and complex terrain. Um, what we've done has been in the SOFA code, but we're also working on this in the ExaWind codes at NREL. And all those, those codes are freely available. So any of our Rayleigh damping code is available on the GitHub. Okay, that's, that's what I have. Um, thanks for listening. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Matt, for a great talk. Um, you've really enlightened us on, on gravity waves, where, when they're real, when they're spurious, and how to deal with them. Um, so we'd like to open questions to the audience. Um, feel free to either raise your hand and unmute and ask them live, or if you prefer to put them in the chat, that's fine too. Um, I'll start out, Matt. Um, now we've talked about in our team, uh, you know, the differences between Boussinesque, fully compressible, et cetera. Um, in your opinion, how much compressibility or, or what formulations of density are really necessary to avoid even forming gravity waves in the first place? I don't know. I think that's a I think that's a good research question. I think um, doing side-by-side -side simulations, apples to apples simulations where everything is the same in a Boussinesque and Analastic and a fully compressible code, something simple where you, you would physically, you would trigger real physical gravity waves, but just to see how they propagate in these different kinds of formulations. I think that's something that we really should do, we should really work on. Mm -hmm. Yes, a uh, great idea, uh, uh, area for future research. Uh, Mike, uh, Mike Solinger has a question, Mike. Hey Matt, uh, so remember, I don't know if you remember, we, we first saw these things too, when we did uh, LAS over the complex terrain at the Sierra Madre site. Yeah, and but we saw it even worse in the sense that you know when we wanted to do a convective case, then we had to put a capping inversion to really dampen the upward motion. And as yeah. soon as we used that capping inversion, even if we then did a neutral simulation, that capping inversion would drop down, especially on a on a like a diverging domain, and and act as a lid, and and then really unrealistically accelerate the flow underneath. But it seems like. In your cases, you don't see that anymore. So is that a separate problem from the gravity wave? So you think it's kind of the same thing? No, we see that same exact thing. Um, okay. And I think I showed a lot of simplified cases where, where there is no capping inversion, where there's just constant stratification all the way up and you get gravity waves that, that form and come all the way down, down to the ground. But when you, when you have, like you said, even if you have conventionally neutral followed by a capping inversion followed by stable stratification mm -hmm. those gravity waves up above can create vertical motion at the top of the boundary layer that presses it down in certain yeah. places and it accelerates and then other places yeah. it lifts it and it decelerates yep it's they even made a, a 2d domain like with a two degree down slope and even there we saw it like as, as simple as as it, it is uh, strange for sure yeah and did you think, uh, okay, I'll stop now. No, go ahead. Um, uh, you know, at some point, I suspect that uh, uh, the Richau uh, interpolation that is used in this Pusinesque solver in open form to be the culprit, but maybe that's, that's not the case. I don't think it is. I okay. think it's just, it, it, and it, that's, it goes back to Sue's question. I think 
I think in a lot of situations they are really there, but does does a incompressible boost nest code does it is it just more sensitive? I don't know. And I just wanted to mention one of the things that we found that we were able to kind of work around this um, within SOFA was if we had a capping inversion above that inversion, keeping a neutral boundary layer, uh, that way the gravity waves weren't kind of allowed to bounce around. Um, they just kind of dispersed. So you're saying, Pat, you're saying it's you have whatever stability in the boundary layer followed by a capping, a strong capping inversion followed by neutral. Exactly. Yeah. And we, I think we still saw some gravity waves on the capping inversion itself, but they weren't allowed to propagate and kind of uh, take over the entire domain. Yeah. Or you can just oh. turn gravity off and then everything looks really good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, always an option. <laughs> but Matt, we tried using open foams, fully compressible, but still pressure-based solver, and we often struggled getting them to run. But the few cases we got them to run, we saw the same thing happening. Oh, yeah, really? yeah. I mean, I've, I've only I've only heard anecdotal anecdotal talk from other people, um, like Johann Myers. I've well, I've heard from Dries Eller, who was Johann's student. Dries worked with us. That they've been. They've been playing with analastic and really don't see much difference. Okay, that that's interesting to hear. Yeah. Okay, Minzu is asking: Is there a way to know if the model-generated gravity waves are real or not? Well, I think in a real complex situation, like just general complex terrain, that's that's difficult. I mean, you could do things like you could look at cloud data and see if you can see the waves in the cloud. Um, like our Bigelow Canyon case, that is a real day where, where we're trying to use wharf data from that real day. <clears throat> and you can, look at, you can look at meteorological data to see if there's evidence of actual gravity waves. So that's one way to do it. Another way is you can go to a very simple case and you can go to, you can go to linear wave theory where you can solve or what the wave field would look like and come up with a semi-analytical solution. And then you can compare that to your, your CFD solution. Okay, thanks, Matt. Um, I think we need to move on now. Um, next up this morning is Jeff Maroka from Lawrence Livermore National Lab talking about surface and boundary conditions. All right, uh, can everybody see in here? Looks great, Jeff. Fantastic, okay. Uh, great to be with you all again. Um, so today's uh, presentation is a little bit of a follow-on from, from yesterday's with, with some new stuff as well. You'll recall yesterday um, I presented on um, inflow perturbations and we sort of talked about some of the different strategies for simulating the uh, turbulent boundary layer for wind plant applications and talked about the use of specified versus periodic boundary conditions. And in all of this, um, what was left out um, is the fact that all of these domains have a top and a bottom, and those require boundary conditions as well. I'm not going to talk about the top boundary condition and models. Um, I think Matt and others have, have, have spoken about, about that. But what I wanted to talk to you about um, is the surface boundary condition. And um, as we all are aware, there um, most CFD models for the atmosphere use the Mona Nobukov similarity theory. theory. Um, for finer scale CFD and DNS, of course, you can apply a no slip boundary condition. Um, but for most atmospheric applications, you can't um, put enough grid on the problem. Your, your grid spacing is too coarse to resolve the Kolmogorov microscale and all the dissipation. So you need to parameterize um, the effects of the surface. And we do that with the Mona Nobukov similarity theory. Now, of course, there are problems that have been discussed and I'll discuss a little bit more, um, but we have come up with a couple of ideas to do some, some corrections for how most is implemented into CFD codes. 
I'm also going to describe a modification to an idealized forcing um, capability that we implemented into WARF uh, in the MMC GitHub that people can use then to specify a heat flux or a cooling rate uh, that couples the um, surface layer scheme to a PBL scheme for a sort of a more integrated whole atmosphere semi-idealized simulation approach. Um, so with that, um, let's start with kind of an overview. This is, I'm sure, review for, for almost everybody here, but just to kind of set the framework here, the Mononobukov similarity theory posits a logarithmic distribution of wind speed um, between sort of the viscous sublayer near the surface and some height above the surface, which is generally taken to be on the order of about 10% of the PBL or planetary boundary layer height, layer height. We call this the surface layer. I've indicated here sort of roughly where that might fall within a wind distribution. We know that there's a stress profile that asymptotes towards a constant stress. People call this the constant stress or the constant flux layer. Um, and sort of between this overlap between the lower and the upper log layer, this log law or Mononobukov similarity theory applies. The idea here is that you can derive um, dimensionless, uh, you can derive profiles of the gradient um, of the wind and the potential temperature, or here virtual potential temperature, but think of this as, as temperature. Um, in terms of universal functions, these phi m and phi h terms are, are universal functions of this variable, which is z over l, where l over is the scaling parameter, the Obukov length. Um, and just to define terms here, u star is the friction velocity. That's just the modulus of the surface uh, vertical fluxes of momentum, and of course the surface heat flux. So these are the scaling variables that go into um, an, into this this methodology. And what you and a couple of other constants. And this is all empirical. Um, this so the, the derivation of the of the functional forms are 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 based on dimensional analysis, but the the parameters are actually um, empirically derived from field experiments. And um, so that creates uh, a, a sort of some, so, some interesting issues. But the idea is that you can integrate these, uh, these, these gradient uh, uh, formulas and derive kind of an expected distribution of wind speed in the boundary layer. Um, and this is the famous log law that everybody knows about. And um, in special cases, for example, for, for neutral flow, the phi of m is equal to exactly one. So this term disappears and you just have the standard log law. That's all great. Um, so how is most actually applied in computational fluid dynamics models? I mean, obviously the flow is solving the wind distribution. You're not applying the wind distribution, but you are applying a surface flux boundary condition. And this is where the Mononobukov similarity theory comes in. You need to have the surface stresses at ZS and the surface in the, you know, the tau 1, 3 and tau 2, 3 terms, these, these guys here. And to do that, you take um, the winds, the, 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 the scalar wind speed and the component wind from the first grid point above the surface, and you use a drag coefficient. The drag coefficient is where the log or M Mononobukov uh, functions live. So this is how Mononobukov gets into the boundary condition and into, into the solution. So this is what we apply in, in our CFD models. So is that good or bad? Well, as, as has been discussed here, this is just a summary, but um, there are lots of assumptions and caveats to using Mononobukov. Um, it's fine when you have very coarse grid spacing and homogeneous conditions, um, but when you get away from those idealizations, as we often do in, in complex flows, and especially um, when, we, when we refine the resolution of our models, most not designed for this, but based on mean profiles. So even if you have homogeneous flow enforcing conditions in your LES, if you're resolving variability in the velocity, you know, high, high frequency, you're violating the assumptions of Mononobukov. And because you're using sort of a mean parameterization at every, Every vertical grid cell in your in, at every every horizontal grid cell to close that that surface stress, you may be suppressing the flow variability, and there are other things that that may be a deleterious impacts of using most. Okay, so why do we use it? Well, because it's almost all we have, um, but that's changing. Um, so I 
I'm not going to talk too much about the, uh, I'm not going to talk at all about the machine learning based methods that are coming online, but there will be a talk later on today about that. I'm going to talk a little bit about a pseudo canopy model, which is kind of a distributed drag form that helps to correct for some of the implementation issues with Lonodobokov. And of course, there's lots of new stuff coming up in the offshore environment um, that will move away from Mononobukov, use other bulk formulations, or perhaps explicit moving waves. I'm not going to talk much about those, but um, the future is, is going to move beyond most slowly but surely, and we're, we're trying to push the envelope on a couple of these fronts here in this project. So um, I want to show a couple of results of past work showing where some of the issues lie in most when it's applied in CFD models. And one of those is that it doesn't always accurately recover the boundary condition that you're, you're trying to impose. So this is from an old paper where we implemented a new, more advanced um, nonlinear backscattering anisotropy subgrid turbulence model into WARF um, and compared that with the existing Smagorinsky and Lilly models that were in WARF. And what I'm showing here are profiles of what I called on the last um, slide with a slightly different variable. But the nomenclature here is, is, is that this phi is equal to one for neutral conditions. So the line phi equals one is indicated here with this, this nice gray vertical line. And these are actual profiles of the phi function evaluated from um, periodic LES time averaged. And we can see that the different subgrid models provide different errors. Um, the new models generally do a little bit better than the older models, but there are still issues near the surface with these overshoots and undershoots. And these are, you always see these in the literature, which is interesting because even as you're applying, you know, Mona Nobukov, you don't recover it in, in your code because you would expect these profiles to at least, you know, follow um, the expected form up to maybe 0.1 or 0.15, but they, they deviate really close to the surface. Another way that you can look at this is to plot on a log scale um, on the, on the x-axis here, z over h, against u normalized by u star, and you expect for a logarithmic profile a straight line, and you can see that there are these deviations in the vertical profile from the different models. And you see some general characteristics of these deviations, you know, a little bit of an undershoot followed by an overshoot. Now, this is for a few different models at a few different aspect ratios. And this is another thing that's that's interesting about this is the deviation depends on the subgrid model, but it also depends on the aspect ratio of the grid, which may have something to do with how um, different features are, are sort of filtered out when you use coarser or finer horizontal grid spacing relative to the vertical grid spacing. For example, here, the dashed lines in all of these plots are an aspect ratio of one, where these dashed followed by three dots are an aspect ratio of eight. So even if the native resolution is changing from you know, 16 meters in the horizontal to 32 to 64, the aspect ratio um, effect uh, persists across these, these changes in, in actual sort of resolution. Um, so we've tried to do some other things. Uh, one thing that we, we, we did was we added a couple of dynamic models to the WARF um, family of subgrid models, one being the dynamic Wang Lily model of Tina Chow's group, and also the Lagrangian average scale dependent model of Oseid and Menevo and uh, some of the folks at Johns Hopkins. Um, these are dynamic models, so they use a filtering to sort of coarsen the grid, and then they look at how the resolved scales change across the resolved stresses change across scales. Um, now, an interesting thing about this model is that when you put it into WARF, you have to add a little bit of a correction to cover the mean stress. And this is referred to as, as a canopy model. Um, why do we have to do this? Uh, well, so the, the left panel here shows simulation results from the Smagorinsky model on the left, um, the TKE model on the right, on the left here is the um, dynamic Wang Lily model, and the lower right here is the Lagrangian average scale dependent model. These two models down here have this extra canopy term. And the reason is because when implemented into WARF, um, the numerics of the finite difference solver actually truncate um, some of the resolvable scales of motion. Um, so you get a smaller prescription for the surface stresses than you otherwise would if you use, say, a pseudo-spectral code. So these models were developed in pseudo-spectral codes, but when you implement them in WARF, you have to make a, a correction. And this is, you know, sort of the fun and games you play with these more advanced subgrid models. More accurate, perhaps, more physics, but also more degrees of freedom. 
So you can see in this lightly dashed line here, there's a little bit of a near wall stress model that augments the surface stress. And you need to get that in order to recover a linear stress profile like you expect. So once that's all done, then you can actually look at the phi function and you see that you've improved the situation a little bit, but you haven't really removed the, um, the incorrect vertical profile that you would expect. And this is just an image showing um, in, in the log space plot um, that you get a little bit better with the dynamic models down here, but you still have some issues. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about a method that we invoked here to try to fix this a little bit. Okay, so how does this work? We've got the log law here with our drag coefficient. This is a vertical section of a computational mesh where you've got the surface down here. This can be the X or Y direction. And so you've got surface grid points and often your velocity is solved sort of in the middle. And these are just numberings for your Z levels going up. So your first model grid cell is here and your second model grid cell is here. All right. And what you're trying to do when you advance the model equations is you're trying to solve the time evolution of the velocity component. And one of the terms is this vertical divergence or this, the divergence of the stress. And if you just look at the vertical component of that, it ends up being the vertical difference of tau 1, 3 or tau 2, 3 in the other direction divided by delta Z. All right. So, but this value right here is actually the surface value at k equals 1. So you have to close that somehow. And that's where Mona Nobukov comes in. We use this stress formulation with the drag coefficient and we get the velocities that go into that from the first model grid cell. So this is how you get the bottom stress. And then of course, the next stress that you need to get the difference comes from your turbulence model, which here I'm just calling generically M turb. All right, and this of course goes up throughout the column. And that's how you, you end up with your, your wind profile and how the, the surface boundary condition interacts with the turbulence model to de determine the flow. All right. It's a lot of details. So how does this work? Well, on the right here, I'm plotting simulation results from a bunch of different runs. One is using a standard Smagorinsky model. So this black line here is the standard Smagorinsky model with the Mona Nobukov similarity theory applied at the surface. But there are all these other lines on here. What are these other lines? Well, suppose you just wanted to plot the log law directly and see what it would give you the log law really is just based on u star here and height above the surface. So we can get the u star, of course, by just taking the tau 1, 3 and tau 2, 3 that we get here that use the lowest model velocity, plug that into the log law and plot it. And if you do that, you get this vertical dashed line. And notice that it's quite a bit different from the actual simulation. And this error here is due exactly to this the fact that the model doesn't implement the surface boundary condition quite correctly because there are errors in the numerics and there are errors in the subgrid models. And so trying to use more advanced subgrid models is one way of trying to fix this problem, but we see that that doesn't fix the whole problem. So what have we done? Well, one of the things that we did was we borrowed from the, oh, and here's just an, another depiction of that in, in, in the log space showing the deviations. So what are all these different colored lines? Well, what we did instead was we decided to borrow from sort of the canopy literature and apply the stress as a distributed drag. In other words, rather than applying a drag coefficient at the surface to get the surface stress, distribute that drag coefficient over some depth with some sort of a profile function of Z, which we're calling A of Z here. And I'll demonstrate what all this means in a minute. So what we're doing now is we're actually adding a forcing term to the momentum equations as a function of height. So this A value decreases over height, but you're applying it not as a surface stress anymore, but as an actual drag term during the solution of the momentum equations with height. So you can, how do you get the, the, the right bulk drag? Well, you can evaluate the standard drag coefficient parameterization from Mona Nobukov with some value of Z naught. You stick that in here and you get a drag coefficient out here. And what we do is we basically, um, distribute that drag coefficient over height, uh, according to this formulation, which if you invert for the CD that you're putting in to the momentum equations, it's the CD most that you derive from here. And this is just a numerical integration um, of the height function. And you have to do that because if you're only using a grid, few grid spaces, you've got to account for the, the numerical discretization of, of the integrated quantity here. Otherwise, you'll, you'll get the wrong answer. We found that out the hard way. 
Anyway, the, we've, we're, we've almost got our parameterization here. The last step is, okay, so we need to apply these drag coefficients here, but we also need to apply a function of height. And so A as a function of height is exactly what we're showing in all these different colors. So these are different decreasing functions of height. We used exponential, exponential to the one half, exponential squared, cosine squared. Um, and the this band here <clears throat> is showing the range of sort of all of these different functions. So you get almost the same answer no matter which of these decaying functions you use. And the idea here is that all of these values with the pseudo canopy approach are really, really close to the log law, which is what you expect and what you want. So um, this is work in progress, but we're really excited about this result and are eager to apply it more broadly. Um, another thing that you can do is you can you can add this background um, most um, boundary condition if you want. That was what's, what was done in the paper, but we found that you don't need to do that. You can basically carry the stress as a distributed drag. Another thing that happens when you do this is that you get more flow variability, which is actually, we think, a really positive sign of this approach. Um, in an earlier paper, we looked at the instantaneous resolved flow structures using different turbulence models. And one thing that you'll notice is with the Smagorinsky model, you get these very coarse, robust features, whereas when you move to higher fidelity subgrid models, you get more flow variability. When we apply the pseudo canopy model to just the Smagorinsky closure and just distribute that stress throughout the vertical column, we actually end up with instantaneous flow structures that look a lot more like the more advanced turbulence models. So we think this is helping to break some of the variance reduction that's due to the implementation of most. Lots more work to do on this, but this is a flavor of, of, of something that we've done that we're really excited about continuing the work. In summary, rather than applying the surface stress you can apply Mona Nobukov throughout the column. There are still some things that have to be done. You have to choose some things by hand, but um, and we've only done this for neutral conditions, um, but we would look forward to extending this. Um, and this is also a general application into a model type of thing. So it doesn't really matter what similarity theory you're applying. So this should be able to work with other similarity functions. All the gory details are, are in this paper. Um, or talk to me later if you're interested in learning more about this. In the interest of time, I just want to mention, because this came up yesterday, that um, we also actually did implement a plant canopy model. So for plant canopies where you have flow through, you know, this vegetation, um, the vegetation isn't uniform with height, right? You have more flow space down below sort of the tree canopy, and then you have lots of leaves. So you'll tend to get a non-monotonic, definitely non-logarithmic vertical profile. Um, of wind speed. Um, so we implemented the Shaw and Patton model into WARF. I'm not going to go through all these equations, but the idea here is that you have a source term for the momentum equations. You also have a two-part eddy viscosity term where there's a new term that has to do with this stuff called wake TKE. So in addition to your sort of original subgrid TKE equation that has all the all the you know usual terms, production and advection, you also have a wake TKE equation that has some other parameters uh, that are due to the interaction of the flow with the fine st structures within the, within the canopy. So we implemented this model into WARF. Um, it's there and um, it's, it hasn't made it into the MMC um, repo yet, but it could be put in there and should be put in there. Um, and we look forward to using this in the future in some of our onshore vegetated canopy work. The last thing that I'll, I want to run through just very quickly here as I'm getting a little bit low on time is that we did add one new capability to the WARF MMC GitHub repo, and that is an ability to force um, the surface with a specified surface heat flux or a specified cooling rate in a way that works with a surface layer and a PBL model combination. So basically, we've taken the relationship here that the heat flux is some exchange coefficient times a gradient, here in this case, gradient of temperature. We can do this with moisture too. These are just some definition of terms, don't need to go into too much. But the idea is you can't just apply a uniform heat flux within these WARF models because these exchange coefficients in, in, in the codes are dependent upon a lot of other things. And it's just very difficult to make all of this consistent with a specified heat flux. So what we did instead was we, um, inverted this equation for the surface temperature so that you can apply a heat flux 
and it finds the right surface temperature that relative to the air temperature and relative to this exchange coefficient will um, satisfy the surface heat flux locally. Okay, so we did this through these nameless parameters where you can define whether you want to apply it locally, apply it in a domain average sense, and you can specify the heat flux as a real number or the heating rate as a real number. Um, and the modified codes are just a few bits and pieces here. Um, we use the existing surface layer revised model that works um, with YSU and MYJ, and I think a couple of other PBL models. We could incorporate this with other PBL models. We just started with these two, but um, there's, there's one new module that sort of sets up the, the variables that are needed. We can also, with this scheme, specify a Z0, a latitude, which sets the Coriolis parameter in the geostrophic forcing, excuse me, um, and an ability to specify initial perturbations at the beginning of a periodic LES if you want to trigger some flow disturbance that will evolve over time and spin up into turbulence. So this is different from the inflow boundary perturbations. It's just something to start an idealized periodic LES. These capabilities are avail available in the MMC GitHub. So let me just summarize quickly. Um, this was sort of a quick survey of, of most, still widely used, but it is fundamentally inaccurate in most wind energy workflows um, because they involve high resolution, heterogeneity, and unsteady conditions. But we are working as a team and as a community on replacements that are on the way, and we'll hear more about that later on today. Um, and we've also implemented a new ability to force idealized simulations in WARF with heat flux and temperature cooling rates. So I will conclude here and happily answer any questions or take any comments. Okay, hey, Jeff, thank you for all the detail um, here. Does anybody have any questions for Jeff? Uh, again, feel free to either raise your hand or type your question into the chat box. Okay, Jeff, there's a lot of detail here and, um, you know, obviously, it's very complex. Um, a few talks from now, we're going to be hearing about a machine learning version of a surface layer scheme that calculates those fluxes. Um, how do you see machine learning interfacing with the theory and the um, you know, fits that you've been talking about? And where do you see the um, you know, biggest opportunities for advances, given that we now have these new approaches as well. I think that if the new machine learning based approaches are specifying a surface heat flux, then distributing that flux as a drag might provide higher fidelity because that is independent, right? The, the formulation of the surface stresses is, is, is kind of independent of its implementation. Could we also develop machine learning based parameterizations for of the vertical profiles. Now, then you don't maybe need to monkey with the implementation as much. Um, so that would be my, my off the cuff answer to that question. Okay, thanks Jeff. Um, looks like we have Mark asking another question. Michael Stollinger? Yes. Yeah, thanks. Thanks Jeff for that uh, really interesting talk. So, so I was curious because you know, early on in these papers, people used the variable phi, so they showed the normalized velocity gradient, right, to show their mm -hmm. overshoot. Yeah. And that was always done as a post-processing step. So after you have the average velocity, you, you calculate the gradient. But in the first two grid points, you always have an error of 20 uh, and 5%, because with any differencing operation, you cannot capture the gradient of the logarithmic velocity profile. Yeah. So in turn, if we go away and, you know, like most of these codes use some form of, of differencing. Do you think that uh, the error in, in, in that approach of calculating the gradient to get the stress is what, what prevents, you know, what causes this under prediction of the stress that you try to, to compensate by adding a drag a little farther upward, not just in the, in the bottom surface? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, the, the log profile should, 
be a nonlinear profile. So I, if I'm understanding you correctly, it's the vertical differencing of a logarithmic profile is going to lead to errors because it's a discrete lower. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no matter. First grid point, no matter yeah. where you put it, the first grid point, you have a 20% error because yeah. the closer you put it, the stronger the gradient becomes. It's it's yeah. um, Johan Meyer showed right. that too in one of his papers, I think. Yeah, that's... um. Potentially another correction. My 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 thinking is that you would still have issues with implementation, but um, that's that's something to take into consideration. Okay, Matt. Matt, your hand went down. Oh, there you are. Sorry, I have it muted. This question comes up all the time. Of you're simulating a wind farm or or something with complex terrain like how do you how do you localize the surface stress and surface heat flux what's the i, I don't know that anybody knows the proper way to do it but what's your opinion on that um well how you do it i mean just through the numerical implementation is you just look at the vertical you know you, you have a as a local Z naught value, a local temperature, you have yeah. air temperature above it, you have the wind speed and, you know, you get the exchange coefficient, but, um, but it's a better way. average over patches. Some people looked at averaging over patches and things like that. I know you guys have, have done some of that, I think in SOFA where you've used domain averages. Um, I yeah, haven't seen Yeah, but we've done domain averages, but maybe say more about domaining, oh, averaging over patches. I, I can't say any more about it than other than it could be something to to try to recover. Um, but then I, I still think that you're applying, you know, something that was <clears throat> designed to a, you know, for one size sort of ensemble average or patch to a, a different size patch. And it feels to me like it's a duct tape and bailing wire. And, you know, maybe we just need to move, move beyond Mononobukov. But I haven't done a you know a, a really deep dive into you know how to extract the best performance. I think it would just vary so much with different landscape types and the roughness you know variability. I, do you have any thoughts on that, Matt? You'd like to share with us? No, I, mean, I just. If I mean, I, did you see a marked improvement in any any of your metrics when you did the averaging versus applying things locally? Um, I don't know if it's an improvement, but it's, it's a little bit different, but then like, if we do a wind farm with wakes, we'll just do things locally, but then you think, well, well, does Mona Nobukov hold underneath the wake? Well, probably not, but we just use it because yeah. we haven't come up with something better. Okay, we have some active conversation. Actually, some of this is related. Um, Minzu Min says, maybe I, maybe I understood things or misunderstood things. You mentioned that most is not accurate. So why uh, correct model profile against the log law? Right. So if you had a more accurate similarity theory function, functional form, this would address the implementation of that. But, but you're right. Like... <laughs> Fixing the wrong fundamental similarity theory doesn't, in and of itself, seem to make a lot of sense, but this should be more general. Yeah, and Tina Chow comments that people have tried to do a special log climate difference uh, scheme right at the wall for log profile. It helps, but it doesn't fix everything. Um, and, uh, you know, Michael points Miguel out. Miguel has his hand up, I think. Do yeah, and, 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 um, yeah, Miguel, uh, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, sure. I was just wondering, how do you choose the number of vertical levels over which you distributed the drag? But yeah, great question. Details are in the paper. Um, we tried different functional forms and different canopy heights. And we actually have some tables where we show sort of the local minimum, which is, you know, the desired kind of value. It ends up being, you know, four or five model grid points, roughly. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, let's move on to the next talk. Uh, there is another question from Herbert Owen that you might want to answer in the chat, Jeff. All right. Um, but let's move on to Pat Habecker of NCAR, who's going to talk about offshore wind modeling. 
And if I could find on mute, um, how's it look? You seeing the right screen? Yep, looks great, Pat. All right, thanks, Sue. Um, yeah, so I'm Pat Halbecker from NCAR and uh, gonna discuss some of the work we've been doing on offshore wind modeling. So as was alluded to in the intro yesterday, um, offshore wind in the US is projected to increase. And so as of this year, the US had only two operating wind farms, uh, but two more under construction and 18 more that were permitted. Um, and even in just the mid-Atlantic, the uh, US North Atlantic, I guess is what they call it, um, a lot of wind leased areas ready to go. And so from 2020 to 2021, there's a 24% growth and an additional 13% from uh, 21 to 2022. And with the target from the Biden administration being 30 gigawatts by 2030, it's going to have to grow a lot more in the next seven years. And one of the ways uh, that we're going to get more energy from these uh, offshore turbines is just by them being larger. And there's also an interest in creative ways to use the energy that has uh, gathered offshore, including green hydrogen. And so new ways to store energy and new ways to, to transport it. So some differences between onshore and offshore, um, as just mentioned, the larger size and capacity of these turbines is going to be um, a big change in the engineering side. Uh, and also just by being in an ocean with variable depth, we're going to have to deal with either moored, floating, or even um, instances of uh, perhaps traveling turbines in the ocean. Um, and this is going to make the transportation of energy very complex. And then on the weather side of things, one of the biggest differences between onshore and offshore is the low but variable roughness of the surface. Uh, and this is essentially just waves. So with higher winds, you'll get larger waves and a higher roughness. And then also if you're, if you have the, the same wind speed, but your depth is shallower, these waves might be steeper and start to break which will also uh, increase your roughness. There's also some assumptions that we make onshore of when are gonna be good times for wind and bad times for wind based on just the diurnal cycle. But offshore, unless you have uh, winds coming from onshore, you're probably not gonna see much of a diurnal cycle. And so we can't make the same assumptions that we previously have uh, for onshore wind. Also, we're gonna be dealing more with hurricanes um, in some parts of the ocean. Uh, and hurricanes do make landfall, but the second they make landfall, they start to weaken uh, due to increased roughness from, from the surface. So when they're over the ocean, you're going to have a lot more severe winds from these hurricanes. Um, and this same sort of idea applies to uh, frontal passages, nor'easters, things like that, where the, the wind speeds offshore due to a lower roughness, uh, relative lower roughness, is going to just increase uh, the potential for severe winds. And then in some places, such as uh, the Great Lakes, uh, we might be dealing with a lot of sea spray and icing. And this is, again, something just by being over water, uh, the potential for icing is, is going to be somewhat high. So waves um, within models, and essentially this boils down to just your surface friction, cause some interesting problems. So within an onshore environment, something like complex terrain, uh, trees, cities, any of that sort of friction can really sustain turbulence in a large eddy simulation. However, once you move to offshore with this relatively low roughness, uh, it's, we've found that it's difficult to sustain turbulence in an LES uh, model. And so with this friction from waves, which is a function of your advected waves, the local wind speed, and then also your water depth, we need to, to find a way within our model to characterize um, this roughness. And so one of the projects we've worked on is implementing a uh, shallow water roughness parameterization uh, into WARF, which is now available in the main version of WARF and it's also in the MMC version, um, which these figures down here on the bottom are showing where the roughness, so Z naught roughness, um, the difference when using the original formulation, the Charnock formulation, uh, minus the roughness derived from this new shallow water roughness, we can see that within the depths that are between 10 and 100 meters, so kind of near shore, 
we're getting in some places 100% uh, double the roughness for this shallow water roughness equation. And this translates to uh, four, four meter wind speeds that are, these are year long simulations and just the averaged uh, differences. Over a year, we're getting around half a meter per second uh, decrease of wind speed at four meters, and then still some, not maybe not a huge amount, but I mean a quarter meter per second wind speed difference over the year. And then in some cases, it'll be uh, much higher. We, we need to figure out ways to implement these, uh, this, the differences from having waves as our surface roughness. And so as kind of mentioned, this turbulence generation in LES is going to need to be carefully considered uh, for turbulence in our models to be sustained. So one of the cases that we've worked on is a case study over the North Sea. Um, I think we just mentioned it yesterday. This is the Fino One Tower uh, that's right next to the Alpha Ventus wind farm you can see in this top right image. And the objective of this uh, study was to assess performance of different downscaling techniques. So these figures on the bottom are just a subsection of simulations uh, with the far left being this offline profile assimilation method case, the second figure being the offline but directly coupled uh, and adding cell perturbation methods. So this is SOFA running with uh, wharf inflow and outflow boundaries. The middle panel is a control with wharf, so it's inline LA, mesoscale to microscale simulation with no perturbation method. And then the last two are two different perturbation methods with an inline uh, version of WARF. And so we can just see that there's different uh, turbulent properties for each of these cases. And so a way to kind of quantify that is by looking at spectra. So these are three, uh, the three components of wind speed, the spectra of each of those, and maybe first focus on this red line, which is the WARF control experiment. So this is uh, without any perturbation method. There's very little energy across all scales if you don't have any perturbation method and this is over water uh, so that kind of idea of there's not not much sustained turbulence uh, but if you have these different uh, perturbation methods or different ways of running your simulations you can recover close to what the observations in blue uh, find for each component uh, uh, TKE I'm sorry energy but with a few of these, like specifically the wharf ones, so the, the purple and brown, we have an overabundance of energy across scales. And so this maybe in this case is indicative of poor performance, but I think the more proper way to look at it is they weren't tuned properly. And so while these are all different and, and have different varying performance in this case, we can't really say one is the best. And I think this was also discussed yesterday of, of just coupling methods, how they just all have different applications. So depending on what case you are looking at, you're going to want to choose one of these methods or the other, or maybe several of them to, to test which one is best. So a quick pivot to um, offshore low-level jets. So low-level jets do happen on land uh, very commonly, but offshore, we've started to notice there's a lot of differences. And I guess maybe not, we've started to notice. This has been something that's fairly well known in the literature for a while. Um, but I think for wind and energy applications, it's only really starting to come into the fold recently. So in just focusing on this mid-Atlantic region, um, it's a pretty common occurrence, especially in spring when you have relatively cool sea surface temperatures and air that's being invective from land over sea that's relatively warm, creating a stable atmosphere. So this bottom left panel shows months of the year, this is from observations, this is not a, a uh, numerical study, um, observed high shear or low level jet events. And this is from summer 2019 to summer 2020. And we can see that in uh, March, April, May, June, we start getting a lot uh, higher number of events. And for these low level jets, the jet nose is quite low. So much different from on land, the, the most uh, common low level jet height was around 80 meters. And a lot of these uh, low level jets were associated with strong frontal systems. So this panel on the right 
you can see just a kind of schematic of the synoptic setup for uh, these jets to form where you have a, a frontal a cold front coming from west to east and this warm air is being evicted from the south over relatively cool waters and as the front uh, gets closer to your point of interest this point of interest being the Nicerta floating lidars you're getting uh, increased advection of warm air so you're getting a faster uh, low-level jet and then a uh, more stable environment and then as the uh, cold air from the cold front passes you immediately get a shutoff in your low-level jet and you uh, start seeing a more convective environment. So another study we've been working on is trying to examine the sensitivity of these offshore low-level jets to sea surface temperature and this study uses a five domain simulation with our grid spacing ranging from around six, uh, six kilometers down to 10 meters. And we uh, chose this one low level jet event uh, that you can see in this uh, center figure in the bottom uh, on April 6, 2020. And what we're doing is taking six auxiliary SSD data sets you can see on the right um, with varying resolution and running this uh, mesoscale to microscale coupled simulation for each of these events. So it's pretty expensive running all of these um, LES simulations. We run the LES specifically for six hours. Um, so it takes a lot of CPU to perform this, uh, this study. And one of the questions we wanna ask is, can we perform sensitivity studies on the mesoscale to determine which setup performs best? and then run the microscale and expect that to also be the best performing microscale simulation. So some preliminary results from this study, um, this is just showing the mesoscale simulations. And this figure shows air on the top, bias on the bottom, and the hub height wind speed is what we're looking at on the left. Low level shear, which is shear between 20 meters and 100 meters in the center column. And then delta T, which is our difference of air and sea temperature um, for each of these simulations or for each of these SSD data sets. And so all the different colored lines are the different SSD data sets. Um, so looking just at this bright green one, this is the OSPO data set, we can see that in hub height wind speed, uh, we get the, the best performance. Oh, sorry about that. Um, and then in low level shear, we also get the best performance. It's the lowest air and the, the least bias. And then for delta T, we get decent performance. It's nothing great. But if we were only going to run all of these mesoscale simulations and then pick one of them to run a microscale simulation, we would probably choose the OSPO data set. It's, it's the best performer looking at these metrics. So now we ran all of them to, down to 10 meter grid spacing. And now we see that OSPO is the worst for hub height wind speed um, on the LES domains. It is middle to low of the pack for uh, low level shear and also uh, the bottom half in delta T. So this is for one case, so it's, it's not a very generalized result, but the idea being that the best performer in LES uh, might not be, I'm sorry, the best performer in micro, mesoscale might not be your best performer in the uh, micro scale. And the, and the LES that end up performing the best were just decent to good performers on the mesoscale. So it's a, a really, this is a preliminary results where we're looking more into this, but it's something we're gonna have to think about in the future because more often than not, people run sensitivity studies on the mesoscale and expect the best performer there to be their best performer on the micro scale. So some open questions in future work. Again, the offshore wind energy uh, science within our group, and then I think just generally is really starting to, to grow and, and gain momentum. Um, and some, some open questions include the wind wave coupling impacts, which there's several studies. Peter Sullivan has done a lot of work um, on this, but it's not something that's entirely accepted within, let's say, the mesoscale wharf community or, or within the MMC uh, project. We, we haven't coupled winds and waves, and that uh, relationship is extremely important to dial down or not dial down, but dial in. Um, we also have a history of assuming near neutral offshore conditions, but climatologically, I'm not so sure that's true. Um, and we don't really have many observations offshore and that's going to change in the near future. Uh, so we can really start answering what would be 
a good climatological uh, wind field to do more engineering uh, tests on. We also need to uh, look at how LLJs with a jet nose below the hub height impact turbine stresses um, and kind of tying into that simulating the entire wind plant offshore in such environments. Um, simulating the entire wind plant and it, we have wake effects and the wake will impact the winds which will impact the waves and then the waves will impact the winds which will impact the wakes. It's, it's a very complex relationship that again, coupling wind wave and then turbines and wakes is uh, going to be of high interest. Uh, also looking at just different forcing conditions, difference in sea surface temperature, the roughness parameterization, all of these things on your annual, annual energy production. Um, and for SST in particular, there's some issues where what the satellite measures isn't necessarily what your numerical weather uh, prediction model is going to expect to be using for SST. Um, and there's also problems with clouds and you, you need to gap fill and how these will impact, especially places that have uh, very traditionally cloudy uh, weather over the offshore environment. How is this going to impact your uh, simulations and your projections for energy? As mentioned previously, icing is another uh, big topic. Uh, we have the Oracle project, so looking at cloud decks um, and impacts of destabilization uh, from the clouds. And then also, as mentioned, tropical cyclones, hurricanes, nor'easters, these severe winds um, are going to have severe impacts and, and we need to start studying them a lot more uh, thoroughly. So this is kind of the, uh, the slide that everyone's showing that this, all of these case studies are uh, documented on the MMC read the docs and the setups and analysis scripts are on the MMC GitHub. Um, so for anyone that's looking to uh, just get some more information about this, you, you can find that on the read the docs and then also any uh, papers that end up coming out from these studies will, will be populated uh, on the site as well. So as a quick summary, again, there's just many open areas of research in offshore wind. Um, one of the main lessons learned is we can't really treat all water bodies the same. Uh, the different currents, wave effects, water depth, I mean, the differences between the Pacific and Atlantic uh, near shore environment are, are vast. And we can't just assume what worked on the Atlantic is going to work on the Pacific. Um, all the different atmospheric conditions that each uh, ocean has to deal with is going to change kind of how we set up our, our models to simulate the, um, the environment. Uh, turbulence generation also needs to be carefully considered. So there is no kind of one size fits all approach. There's pros and cons to each of them. Um, and it's gonna be determined on a case by case basis of which one you should use. Uh, and then lastly, we can't necessarily assume the best mesoscale performer will lead to the best performance on the micro scale. Um, this is something that we've only seen so far in one case, but it, it's worth, delving into uh, more deeply to, to figure out if this is generally kind of the, the case that the best mesoscale is not gonna lead to the best microscale. Uh, so here are some references from uh, just on the slides uh, for, for your, if you wanna look them up. Um, and with that, I will take any questions. Thanks Pat for a very clear and interesting talk. We have one question already showing up in the chat. Uh, from Lou Bowers of Avant Grid Renewables. Have you done any work looking at how sharp SST gradients from coastal upwelling impact the height of the jet nose? Not yet, um, but the SST gradients is absolutely, it was kind of, I can go back to um, this figure, kind of from some other research with the, um, it was dealing with the Chesapeake Bay, the, the gradient was a big issue. And so that was a big interest in getting this GO16 data set here where we get very sharp gradients. Uh, we have not looked into it in detail yet, but SST gradients is, yeah, it's something we need to consider. Yeah, <clears throat> and to say that's uh, definitely a place where you'd need a uh, gap filling for your SST data because you need uh, 
you know, really high resolution, like ABHRR with gap filling. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. Um, Min Zhu asked for what water depth range is the shallow water roughness model, model applicable? This is for 10 to 100 meters. And based on the Atlantic, um, and so we can kind of, let's see, maybe use this figure first. This actually, I think, does show bathymetry. Um, I, I don't have a, yeah, here we are, the color bar on the, uh, the right here. It's I'm kind of maxing out that light blue at 60 meters. So most of these are, are really within that range that the, the shallow water roughness is going to be applied. Mm -hmm. Okay, Nick Smith is asking, do we have enough observational data in the US to answer the questions? Um, the Fino one study is interesting, but we then apply North Sea results to the US. Yeah, exactly. So no, um, more observations are always going to be helpful. Uh, the two floating Nicerta buoys, and there's also a few, the, um, there's the DOE Martha's Vineyard, um, I, I can't remember all of them right now, but there's a few on the, in this region of, of the ocean where we're gonna need more um, West Coast, Southeast US and in Great Lakes. Yeah, so, so more is always gonna be needed. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, William Pringle asks, would the shallow water roughness model be applicable to the Great Lakes also? Yes, um, you actually can kind of see it in the top left of this panel. Um, I forget what lake that is. I'm not uh, very familiar with the geography, but um, yeah, you, you can see that it, these are um, generally within the depths that this is applied to. Uh, so it does impact those lakes and then any other rivers and uh, things like that within the model. If, if Wharf can see it, and that's another big thing that was added uh, to Wharf was a bath, uh, bathymetry data set. And so now with the, uh, if you're familiar with WARF, the GEOG um, package will include bathymetry. Um, Min Zhu also says, asks, uh, so what factors do you think are most important in making the micro-scale offshore modeling successful, even the best mesoscale performer is used, even if it is used? Yeah, it's, <laughs> I can't say I have a good answer for that yet. Um, Cause it, it's, it's just tricky. I mean, the, the PBL parameterization and the LES uh, solver are not going to produce the same result and they're gonna be sensitive to different things. And I think that's the heart of this, um, at least this study here is if you took these in an idealized case and ran uh, the PBL scheme and the LES with the same surface forcing based on the different SST conditions, uh, you would probably get a similar answer uh, in, as what we're seeing with the real data case of WARF. Um, so not, not sure yet. I think it's unfortunately somewhat opening a can of worms um, of the way we've historically done it might not be, uh, yeah, it might not be doing what we expected it to. Mm -hmm. And going back to observations, Lou Bowers added that Hui has ASIT and LIDAR. Um, Larry mentioned Lake Erie. Uh, let's see, Brian's answer uh, question got answered. Does anybody else have any questions for Pat before we move on? Yeah, this is Jeff. I've, I've got maybe a comment or two. Um, I think. Over the course of this project, we have sort of expected that when you add an LES domain to, you know, within an existing sort of mesoscale simulation, that the LES would kind of provide some turbulence information, but not really change the fundamental wind speed and direction profiles. And we're finding that's not always the case. So, um, this is definitely something interesting to to, to keep looking into. A second thing I would add is in terms of like near neutral um, conditions, like I think we're all learning too that you don't have to be very far away from neutrality to have really different profiles. Uh, 
again, intuitively, you'd think, well, you know, if your fluxes are only maybe order 10 watts per square meter, you're pretty close to neutral. But if you actually look at the profiles and the fluxes, um, there are really step changes. So that zero surface heat flux neutral profile is just, uh, it's almost a ghost. Yeah, and, and for different regions of, of the world, um, or just the, for the ocean in particular, depending on your predominant wind direction uh, will really change it. If you have a, a place, let's say on the West Coast, where your predominant winds or the fetch over the ocean is really long, maybe you do get closer to neutrality um, a lot of times, but then East Coast, it's just your, your predominant winds can shift from land to sea uh, just with a minor change in direction. And yeah, as you're saying, it doesn't take much to throw it completely away from, from neutral. Mm -hmm. And we're learning a lot as we go. And thanks for catching us up, Pat, on everything um, you know that we've learned, at least in this project. And later on, we'll hear about some other projects that will be happening um, to dig deeper into some of these issues. But for now, let's move on to the next slot, which is a pair of machine learning talks. Uh, David John Gagne of NCAR will talk about machine learning surface layer scheme uh, that we've alluded to in past talks. And then that will be followed by Sue Detling talking about using deep learning to downscale from mesoscale to microscale. So David John, why don't you go ahead and start? Thank you, Sue, for the introduction. Uh, so good morning, everyone. My name is uh, David John Gagne. I'm a machine learning scientist in the Computational Information Systems Lab and the Research Applications Lab. Uh, my co-speaker for the session will be Sue Detling, uh, who's also in the, the Research Applications Lab. Uh, and we're, we're going to, in our talk, as I'm getting this slide up, uh, the first part of the talk will, will We'll be focusing on uh, machine learning in the surface layer, uh, followed by a, a section on machine learning downscaling. And then uh, Sue and I will come back and we'll do a kind of Q&A panel for, for the last, last 10 minutes. So to kick things off, uh, we have the um, machine learning surface layer. This is joint work with myself, Pat Hallbecker, Bronco Kosovic, and uh, Sue Ellen Hopped. Um, Kind of the motivation for this, and Jeff, I think, gave, gave a really good deeper dive in, in, into this in, in his talk. Uh, but the, the underlying idea behind the surface layer parameterization is that you wanted to couple your atmospheric model with the land surface and ocean models and, and basically help you calculate the fluxes based off of the, the gradients and temperatures and wind and, and moisture. Uh, Depending on the model setup, the, the the outputs of this feed into different pieces and something like WARF, the, the, for, the forcing from the calculated in the surface layer parameterization goes into the land surface model and the PBL parameterizations that then feed back into the atmosphere. Um, one, of, one of the challenges we run into though with, with surface layer parameterizations is that they are based off of mono Bukov similarity theory, uh, which Jeff kind of explained a lot of the where where it uh, kind of deviates, uh, where it works well, and where it deviates from ideal performance and observations. Uh, with that, Mona Bukov has not like is pretty well established and and can be hard to beat by itself. Um, so one thing we wanted to do was see if we could uh, make make some improvements to some of the existing schemes by. Uh, using machine learning trained on observations and, and taking the machine learning estimates of, of different uh, flex parameters, uh, plugging those into sort of the existing WARF surface pipeline and seeing if that will uh, give us results that, that are closer to observations. Um, and one of, one of the key advances that we're gonna talk about in this talk is how we've actually evaluated these surface layer parameterizations in NWP models. So uh, some background on, on, on this work, we, we have two papers that just came out in the past uh, month or so. Um, in the first one, we, we fit a um, basically random forest and neural network models to observations of service layer fluxes and 
meteorological tower observations in Kabbalah and Idaho. And we found that uh, like on the observation level, there seemed to be a closer fit from the machine learning than there was from Mona Nobukov to into those locations, uh, which in some ways is probably not all that surprising. If um, you have a model that's optimized for a particular location, you would hope that it would do better than something that is a little bit more general. Uh, so we, we, we got a good performance with that and, and next put it into the fast eddy, large eddy simulation model and ran a number of idealized test cases comparing fast eddy's implementation of Mona Nobukov with different neural network configurations. Uh, we found that for uh, U-star and for the kinematic sensible heat flux, uh, the machine learning models are pretty consistent and perform well uh, and capture kind of diurnal cycles and, and other forcings pretty appropriately and have some slight deviations from Mona Novikov in, in, in this model, but not, not dramatic ones. Uh, we, we get much bigger differences uh, in with the moisture flux, but that was also, I think, one is the underlying uncertainty in the moisture flux relationship is much larger. Uh, and, and so there is more un, under epistemic uncertainty essentially in the machine learning fits. Uh, one of the lessons we also learned from this is that we, for, for the initial paper, we um, kind of threw the kitchen sink of inputs at the model. Uh, and when we did this within Fast Eddy, we were running into issues with um, basically kind of unexpected performance and, and other weirdness happening in the model. So we we discovered that cutting down the number of inputs uh, uh, helped model performance a lot. Um, so this is a lesson we took over to Wharf. Uh, so for this particular project, we um, started with observation data for, for the models we sh were showing here. We trained them off of our, the K and MI tower in Kabah. Um, we, we used four inputs to each of the neural networks that predicts each flux. So 10 meter wind speed, the 10 meter to skin potential temperature gradient, the bulk Richardson number, uh, and then the 10 meter skin mixing ratio gradient, which also includes a, um, a soil moisture uh, uh, as a scaling factor. Uh, the outputs of these models are friction velocity, kinematic sensible heat flux, and kinematic latent heat flux. We feed all these into a uh, first a, a fully connected neural network trained in Keras. Uh, here's kind of the parameters, but pretty standard configuration. And we've played around with some of these settings and gotten similar fits. So, so I don't think it's a hugely hyperparameter sensitive problem. Uh, we also used a random forest. Uh, one of the key things with the random forest is you have to, if you wanted to run fast in the model and not take up a ton of space, uh, you have to kind of chop off the, trim the, the, the leaves a bit. Uh, so we have a max 1,024 leaf nodes. Uh, we ran this in WARF single column model. Uh, we used the YSG PBL scheme and the, but we've tested this successfully both the slab and the rock lane surface models. Uh, this scheme does not work with NOAA uh, because of how NOAA, the NOAA land service model connects with the surface layer scheme. It basically only uses the sensible heat um, exchange coefficient and does not incorporate and makes, it makes its own assumptions about the latent heat from that. Uh, whereas the slab model and the rock land service model can take the exchange coefficients from both sensible heat and latent heat directly into the model. Uh, we've tested this on two cases, uh, cases 99 or Gables 2 in Kansas and Gables 3. These are both kind of idealized uh, simulations. Um, so first, uh, cases 99 slash Gables 2 uh, have plotted uh, the Q star, theta star, and U star uh, time series from Mona Nobukov at the top, then neural network in the middle and random force at the bottom. You can see that all of them kind of capture a, a diurnal cycle and, and all the different fluxes. Uh, some of the key differences, uh, the both machine learning models have a higher, uh, basically, theta star at night uh, in comparison with uh, Mona Nobukov. Uh, they also have a slight negative Q star at night, but then revert to a uh, positive value during the day, whereas uh, with the current Mona Nobukov setup and WARF, Basically, it tapers the, the Q star down to zero at night and then increases it during the day. Compared with observations, um, I'd say that the machine learning models at least seem to be a little bit closer on temperature and on moisture uh, during the day. At night, um, it, it's definitely, all of them have similar kinds of slopes 
uh, with the machine learning models, we see, seem to have a bump up in, in temperature and then kind of a steady decrease. Um, so some of this could be uh, affected by how, how the models initialize and kind of the more idealized forcing compared with the actual observations. Uh, but the, the trends in, in general, I think look pretty promising. Uh, there's definitely still things we'd like to address further, but but at, at this point, I think in general, it seems to be working uh, in, in this setting. Um, and, and further refinement, I think still could could be done, but but, but I think given how, how much effort is taken to get to this point, uh, I think it's worth uh, moving forward on it and, and doing more analysis. Uh, we also have some examples showing kind of the boundary layer, temperature and mixing ratio. So you can see the evolution of the boundary layer during the day, we captured the diurnal cycle pretty well. Uh, Monobukov has, has a much moist boundary layer compared with the other ones, which tend to be more static. Um, but otherwise, I think they're, they're, they're all doing pretty well. Uh, for Gables 3, which is trained, which is run at Cabal, um, some of the things we, we saw in this one, the, uh, the bad and the good, on the less great side, the neural network had, had a bit slower spin up compared with the Monobukov, and we're not exactly sure why it's doing that. But once you get into like later into the simulation, we seem to get a better fit with uh, sensible heat flux uh, with, with the neural network compared with Monobukov. Uh, with late, the latent heat flux, we see a, a higher latent heat flux with, with uh, MO compared with the neural network. Um, and and uh, U-star generally capture the diurnal cycle, but there are some fluctuations that, that are happening kind of in the middle of the run. Uh, that we're not exactly sure what's going on with that, but they're they're sort of damped out. Uh, in terms of the ground level things, in line with sensible heat flux being being more closely mo uh, modeled, we we see a, a much closer fit to observations later in the run with with the neural network compared with Monobukov. Uh, but with moisture, it's a, neither of them captures the moisture particularly well. Mo is a little bit too moist, and uh, the neural network is a little too dry. Um, but but they're all in the right ballpark, right orders of magnitude. No crazy things going off the rails with it. For so so we're I think we're pretty excited about where we've gotten with this um, after quite a few false starts on the project. Um, so so I think the performance is promising in these idealized work simulations. Uh, and since we've also run this in a fast ID LES uh, and, and seen good performance, I think we're getting increasing confidence that. That this could be a, a, a have a broader path forward uh, going into the future. Uh, some of the lessons learned, I think, is trying to simplify things as much as possible will help the debugging process and allow for more predictable behavior when when the machine learning is coupled into the NWP model. Um, ensuring consistent calculations is, is really important uh, between whatever your training data is and how you're running it in, in WARF. Uh, and then there's a lot of feedbacks that kind of made debugging where the problem was coming from really challenging, but we, we were able to eventually work through all, all the issues um, and think, have built up a lot, of, a lot of knowledge about how this all works. So a, a lot of problems going forward. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Sue Detling to, to talk about downscaling. Okay, hey, Sue, we look forward to hearing um, about the deep learning downscaling next. Can you guys hear me? Um, okay. Yes. We can. All right. That sounds good. I look great. Okay. Um, I'm Sue Detling. I'm a software engineer at NCAR, and I'll be talking about um, using deep learning to downscale from mesoscale to microscale and complex terrain. Uh, the team also includes uh, Tom Brummett, Bronco Kosovich, Sue Haup, David John Gagne, and Pat Haubecker. Oh, this is not advancing. Ooh. Hang on. It's unfortunate. I had to click the screen, Sue. Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, let's see if I got it now. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, so um, yesterday we heard a lot about the motivation for microscale simulations, but I'll repeat a few bullets for any new participants. 
a microscale simulation on the order of tens of meters in complex terrain are needed by the wind energy community since regions of complex terrain can have a, an abundant wind resource. So the simulations are needed for evaluation of things like wind farm location, uh, wind farm design, and estimating harvestable energy. Oh, it's doing it again, hang on, there we go. Um, high resolution simulations, as we've heard uh, for complex terrain are very expensive computationally and time-wise. Um, and they're also very complicated to configure. So um, you saw this uh, movie in Sue and Bronco's presentation, and I have just the image. It's from NCAR's high resolution simulation of a Mount Hood topographic wake for the wind forecast improvement project two. So it took several weeks running on 8,640 cores and took approximately 15 million core hours. Now, um, as Bronco um, showed us, um, the simulation was able to capture very rich flow characteristics, including meandering mountain wakes, downslope flow, flows, mountain valley circulations, breaking Kelvin Hempholtz waves, gravity waves, cold pools, and, and gap flows. So our goal is to apply a machine learning approach to downscaling from roughly one kilometer to 30 meters over the same complex terrain and see if a deep network can adequately and realistically capture the rich flow characteristics which we um, see in the WARF LES simulation. So our models, once they're trained, they can generate high resolution simulations in just a few seconds. So if our models can be applied to other cases and regions, the computational costs of high resolution simulations could be much cheaper and also available outside of the scientific research community. Uh, we used a compound deep learning architecture to achieve the 32 times downscale by training two separate networks that are applied sequentially. The type of deep learning network which we used is called a generative adversarial network or a GAN. And without getting into too much detail, a GAN is actually composed of two sep separate networks. And one of the networks generates the images and the other determines the probability of realness of the generated image. And if um, configured proper properly, then both networks simultaneously improve at their task during training. So our first uh, GAN network trains to downscale four times. So in training, it takes a 16 by 16, 960 meter resolution tile as input, and it outputs a 64 by 64, 240 meter resolution tile. And the second GAN network trains to downscale eight times. So it takes the output of the first network as its input, which is the, of course, 64 by 64, 240 uh, meter resolution tile. And it outputs a 512 by 512, 30 meter resolution tile. Now the low resolution tile in the upper left is one of our testing samples. The medium resolution tiles and the one labeled GAN 30 meter U, those are outputs of our models. So note that our models are not trying to replicate the WARF LES, but generate something uh, plausible given the very low resolution starting point. And by plausible, we mean both visually and statistically. So you can see by comparing the last two tiles that visually our models do remarkably well um, on this test data. We'll address the statistical comparisons in a um, later slide. So um, for testing and training, we used data from the eastern half of the WARF LES simulation uh, that we saw on the second slide. And the image from that slide is in the upper right corner of this slide, just as a domain reminder. Now the horizontal resolution of the WARF LES is 30 meters. The temporal resolution is three minutes. We set aside every third LES file for testing. We used um, seven vertical levels of the LES corresponding to the layer of interest um, to the wind energy community, which is about 30 meters to 160 meters. Now for training, 
At each vertical level, we created 15 kilometer square subtiles of the eastern half of the um, Wharf LES domain. And we used random offsets from domain edges to start the tiling. We also used random offsets to start tiling at each time step. So this decreases the correlation of training samples um, vertically and temporally, as well as augments our training data set. So as inputs to the deep learning networks, we used um, LES fields uh, UV and W, the horizontal and vertical components of the wind, also uh, temperature and high resolution terrain. Now, corresponding sets of low resolution, medium resolution, and high resolution subtiles, like the ones on this slide, are used for um, training the downscale networks. And they were created by coarsening the high resolution WARF LES data with appropriate average filters. So from this process, we made more than 37,000 training samples and we set aside more than uh, 19,000 testing samples. So um, the deep networks are trained on relatively small subtiles of the eastern half of the wharf LES domain. But because the part of the deep network which generates images is a fully convolutional network, once trained, um, that model can be run on a domain of any size. So the images on this slide show the model input output and truth comparison of the U-win component field when the model is run on the full training and testing domain. So in other words, the eastern half of the WARF, WARF LES domain. So in the truth WARF LES field on the right, um, you can see very uh, rich and, and diverse flow characteristics across the domain. You can also see in the middle image that our deep networks working sequentially are able to generate very similar and visu vis visually plausible textures and features from the very low um, resolution starting point on the left. So for, <clears throat> for verification, we perform statistical analysis on uh, testing tile output of the GAN and compared it to the WARF LES. Now, um, in the upper left plot, you see there's um, good agreement between the power spectra of the GAN generated uh, wind data in red and the WARF LES in blue. Um, the upper middle plot shows high value distributions of um, Pearson correlation coefficients for the tiles of GAN generated horizontal wind fields um, and, the, and the WARF LES fields. The upper right shows overlapping histograms of GAN wind speeds and directions, which are a very light colored red, and the LES wind speeds and directions, which are blue. So the overlapping color is the red violet. And since the plots are essentially all red violet, um, it indicates very good agreement between the GAN and the LES wind speeds and directions, which is um, not trivial in complex terrain. The plot in the lower left shows uh, low biases in uh, mean U and V fields. Um, and finally, in the lower right, we see overlapping distributions between the WARF LES and GAN generated velocity gradients. So um, these plots show good agreement, and they also show that the GAN generated gradients have a non Gaussian long tail distributions, which are characteristic of turbulence. And also, not pictured here, we also saw agreement between the statistical moments of the WARF LES and the generated wind components, including good agreements and higher order moments, skewness and kurtosis. Now, as I mentioned earlier, one of the goals is to demonstrate that our models can be applied to other unique regions of complex terrain. So on this slide, we show the terrain height field for the entire W52 WARF LES. Now we trained and tested our networks on the eastern half of the domain, since it's the region where the wind farms are located. We spatially extended our testing samples to include the western half of the domain because it provides an ideal transfer learning test. So you can see in this terrain height image that the terrain in the west is very unique when compared with the terrain in the east. And in fact, it's uh, much more complex. So 
This test case shows the full LES domain low resolution wharf U, which was input to the generative adversarial network. So even at low resolution, you can see differences in flow characteristics between the east and the west. This slide shows the high resolution field generated from applying R2 deep networks in sequence. Um, now, this slide focuses um, on just the transfer region. So we showed the low, resol re low resolution network input on the left, the GAN output in the middle, and then on the right, we have the truth field. So there are some regions um, where the GAN doesn't quite capture the texture in the LES, um, but a smooth output is preferable to generating um, unlikely features or artifacts. Over the majority of the domain, the GAN's performance is pretty good given um, the very unique and more complex terrain. Uh, we performed the same set of comparative statistics on the GAN generated wind and the WARF LES wind in the transfer learning region. We see the GAN is generating a little less energy than the LES, but overall agreement is still good. The wind component um, correlation coefficients for data tiles in the transfer region aren't quite as high as in the uh, training testing region, but they're still very positive. The wind direction and wind speed distributions um, between the LES and the, and the GAN generated um, wind, those align well. Uh, there's a little more uh, spread to the mean bias distributions, um, but still the values um, are basically between plus or minus 0.2 meters per second, which is still uh, quite low. So uh, overall, the results of the statistical comparison are super encouraging on the transfer learning region. So um, our next step, which um, hopefully will be in the next two weeks, is to run the downscale models on mesoscale warp fields at their native resolution. So if successful, this is going to demonstrate the possibility of high resolution sim simulations being available with mesoscale model latency, which is pretty exciting result. Our future um, plans are to um, further uh, test transfer learning by running our deep learning models on other areas of complex terrain. So, for example, the Portugal region of Portugal that Bronco mentioned yesterday might provide a great opportunity for testing and verification. We'd also like to augment our training data with data from other regions of complex terrain where there are, um, are high resolution simulations available. And um, yeah, that's all I have for now. Thank you for listening. Um, if you have questions, my team and I would be happy to answer them. Okay, thank you, David, John, and Sue. Great talk, and you show us some of the possibilities of employing deep learning. Uh, Mark Zagger has a question in the chat for Sue. Um, I just lost the chat when, okay. Um, are the vertical structures also preserved uh, in the GAN generated? And is that consistent yes. with what, okay. Yeah, from level to level, yes. Okay. Um, Which we treated, we treated them all as independent samples. Okay, great. But structure was preserved vertically. Balaji, Jairam, I'm sorry, Balaji. Um, is is there a way to do incremental training as new data becomes available? Balaji, are you referring um, to Sue's talk or David John's? Uh, to the super resolution work. Okay. Yeah. So um, I don't know. Um, I don't. I don't think that that's possible to do. Incremental training. Oh. You mean as you get is it, it as you gather more data, just improving what you already have? Yeah, I mean, I mean, this this applies to both yours as well as uh, David's talk as well, right? I mean, in all these models, like you're trying to improve uh, as you get more and more newer data, um, and and especially in the surface layer parameterizations, that's extremely relevant as well, right? I mean, as you get more and more data sets. Um, uh, that get into the, you know that makes uh, the model more generalizable. 
but do you have to like redo the training process all over again or is there a way to kind of update the model with the newer data i, I can take a stab at this there there is a whole area of machine learning called online learning that that kind of focuses on sort of iterative training as new data is coming in uh one of, one of the big challenges if you are like only like have an existing model and you're refining it with additional data it is making sure the model doesn't forget what it's already learned um i think, I think there are ways to alter the learning rates and other stuff to, to make that the case uh so so it's certainly possible but it may not be entirely straightforward or, or always get the benefit of, of that new data and you also risk maybe biasing too much toward the new data um but, but yeah, it, it's certainly something to consider as some of these, like if we're running a bunch of, yeah, bringing a new surface layer data or other things like that, then I think there's definitely definite interest in, in these kinds of approaches. Maybe you could um, mix um, like new samples with uh, some of the older samples, you know, just create a mixed data set, Trina. Okay, right, thank you. His hand up. Right. Thanks, Sue. I, it was encouraging to see those statistics that you showed. Um, are those just from one snapshot in time, or are they integrated or in time in some way? Um, those are, um, like, like I said, what we did was, I think we had um, an eight-hour LES okay. simulation, and the, the um, LES files were separated by three minutes each. And every third file we put aside for testing. Okay. So, so the um, all the statistics on the test files span the entire. Span that. Model. Okay. Sorry, 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 I missed that because I. Yeah. One thing that struck me is that particularly looking at the TKE, it might be helpful to have maybe error bars aren't exactly the right word, but something to kind of indicate the range. Um, to really to really help us understand if those two distributions are different or not. Okay. Yeah. yeah, Bill Mahoney is asking, do you have a sense of whether there are certain weather regimes that may not perform as well? And Bill, are you referring to the deep learning portion as well? Uh, yes, correct, Sue. Thank you. And, and also kind of, you can have a lot of geographic diversity, you know, in the cases you showed you did, in which you could have different stability regimes um, over the same domain and, and whether it captures would capture those differences. Yeah, and I'll, I'll help with that one. Um, you know, Bill, we had we did train on that one challenge simulation that took 15 million core hours. Um, that was obviously very stable conditions. Um, so I think the answer is we don't know because we haven't tried it yet. Bronco? Uh, well, the simulation was eight hours starting around uh, local noon, maybe a little bit before noon. Um, so it has the initial, and it was March, so it has initial transition to stable conditions, but it was mostly connected. Okay. Thanks. For okay, that. yeah, that time frame, that, that, that's helpful. So it does have some resiliency for those changing regimes. Okay, Anton Kafel asked, did you train one GAN for each level or did you use all in one using different channels? Um, we trained two separate GANs. We, we, we trained uh, one GAN to do the four times downscale. And then we trained a separate GAN to do the um, eight times downscale. And we tried um, training just one GAN and we did we we just never got the um, the results that we wanted. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Min Zhu asks, how many LES cases did you use in training the model? Um, we used just that eight hour simulation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but as Bronco pointed out, there were transitions as part of that. Um, also asks David John, do you think there is a pathway for using machine learning to improve the most theory? Um, you started answering in the chat, but I think it would be interesting to talk about it as well. Yeah, uh, what I mentioned in the chat is, is that there is a growing area of work on sort of these hybrid physical 
like parameter estimation type approaches where you have a a, a physical a hybrid model like Monobukov where there's parameters that are unknown if you fit two data. Uh, and so if you plug it into, if you wrote, wrote this all up as something like JAX or PyTorch or whatever, you, you could theoretically back out what what these parameter values should be as well as potentially uncertainty distributions around them. And that could allow you to, to still use MO, but then have, have it fine tuned in, with, with a, a larger data set than, than the fits that were done back in the 1960s. Um, and that could be interesting is to see how, how sensitive the, those kinds of things are and and compare it with a, a more pure ML approach and seeing if, if one provides more benefit than the other. Uh, even our approach is still kind, kind of relies on a lot of the ML, ML framework, so it's not purely machine learning either. Um, uh, so I, I think there definitely is some promise in this area. The the only downside is you you don't you may not get to use as many features as you would with a with a more pure ML approach. Bronco, would you like to add on there? Yeah, I would just uh, like to add with, with respect to Monio book of similarity that one has to be also cognizant that the similarity theory is developed under certain uh, very uh, restricted assumptions of horizontal homogeneity. Yet it's applied everywhere in from on all scales, from global scales to uh, LES. And it's a, applied in any terrain. So uh, we have to consider the limitations of such a theory um, before trying to fix the parameters in it. So um, I, I think for some parameterization, uh, parameterization, yes, uh, using a physical, combined physical and machine learning approach uh, is the right one. I'm not convinced that it's from Mono Buko. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that, Bronco. Okay, we've had a very interesting session so far this morning, um, really delving into the details, looking at the possibilities of machine learning, we're going to take a 30 minute break. And when we come back, Elliot Kwan will give us a tour of the documentation and codes that are archived as well as our assessment tools. Um, then we'll hear from Larry Berg, his take on what we have accomplished as part of this project. And find, finally hear from Shannon Davis, uh, where DOE's wind te energy technology office sees research in this realm going forward. So look forward to seeing you back at 1130 sharp. So oh, Sue, you said 30 minutes. And then you just said 1130 sharp. Oh, I am sorry. We are late going. Thank you for correcting that, Larry. We will be back at 1130, not quite 30 minutes. OK, very good. <laughs> So from GitHub, um, the next thought I had was, you know, maybe we should all be using the same tools. Let's not repeat effort. And also for consistency in how we're talking about our results and how we're comparing them to make sure we're doing apples to apples comparisons, let's have a common tool set for analysis, for data processing. And then maybe to some of these tools can help with how we set up our cases to, to really get our workflows dialed in. So then the first addition to our GitHub, um, which is linked in the center of the screen, github.com slash A2EMMC, that is our GitHub organization. And within our organization, we have a number of repositories that I'll talk about. So each repository is something you can clone as needed um, to bring out to your local machine or to your supercomputing environment to do these works, uh, this analysis or run these simulations. So the first repository we created was this MMC tools for the reasons I listed below. And then the next step was, um, so if we're interested in simulating a case, whether it's the Columbia River Gorge or it's, it's Lubbock, Texas, in general, the first step is always to kind of look at the data that we wanna to use to either drive the simulation or to use for verification and validation. Um, I'm not sure why this is showing up on the side, sorry about that. So data processing immediately becomes useful 
Um, and then the next step is after you run our simulation, as indicated by this cube with the circles around it, uh, we want to post process our results. Um, and we want to be able to share the results and talk about them both, both internally amongst team members, as well as with folks externally. So that's where this, uh, these Jupyter notebooks come in. And there's been some mention about this by a number of folks um, in different talks um, during the symposium as well. So the Jupyter environment is not exclusively Python, but it's um, a set of interactive notebooks that really put side by side um, your code to do your analysis and as well uh, as well as the output side by side. So you can see what's being calculated and how and how exactly we produced this figure that we're putting into this paper. Um, so the assessment also depends on MC tool and that's our second repository um, that got contributed to our GitHub organization. Um, and after that, then it's, then the thought was, okay, we should probably be using the same version of the code. So then Jeff has talked about and spent some time, a lot of time developing and documenting our MMC version of WARF. Um, so the, this closely tracks the latest versions of WARF. Right now, I think it's up to version 4.2 or 4.2.1, but it also gives us some flexibility to develop new capabilities, which we've talked about. So idealized surface forcing conditions, our different perturbation methods, um, as well as some new sampling routines we've all uh, put into our version of WARF and are eventually going to try to contribute that back to the upstream version. Um, another benefit of this is we can, we can kind of freeze the version we're using for a particular uh, study. So just to make sure we're doing apples to apples comparisons again, we can say everybody should use this tagged version of the code um, just to make sure that, um, especially for those that are familiar with WARF, to, to make sure that there haven't been any uh, dramatic differences or bug fixes between versions of WARF so we can all make sure we're running the same model. Um, and then, of course, naturally, we want to make sure we're plugging the same inputs into these models. So then we've created repositories that um, contain our input decks. Um, I was actually kind of surprised to be able to find a free public uh, icon here for uh, an actual punch card input deck. Um, and I was kind of pleased with that. But anyway, so this is kind of what our, our GitHub organization looks like overall. And then the last piece of this is, okay, so now we have all of these different tools and notebooks and input decks in different places. We really need a way to um, put it all together. So we have uh, the last piece of this is the read the docs, which has also been heavily plugged during this uh, yesterday and today. So this is really professional looking online documentation um, that's automatically generated if you just have a set of text files that you can update. This stuff looks great on your web browser, on your iPad. I, can, I even pulled it up on my phone before this and I can scroll through and look at some of the content we generated. So that was pretty nice. Um, so this is our our GitHub and everything we've been talking about for the last day and a half. So this is the full picture. Um, and in retrospect, it seems like we've done a lot and it really has turned into a really significant part of um, this effort. So there have been some hurdles. Um, so for instance, there's kind of a complex tool chain involved. So in addition to working with, with whether it's Fortran or C++ code, we're we're trying to get everybody on the same page working with Python and the team has different levels of experience with working with Python. And even if you're a Python pro, you might not have used this Jupyter environment. And then the GitHub um, environment adds an additional layer of complexity. Um, so it's nice that it gives, a way, gives us a way to archive and present our Python and Jupyter analyses, but it's, um, it's another environment to work with. Um, there's a whole workflow associated with that, especially if you're developing code for our MMC WARF repository. So there's some learning, um, some hurdles there. Um, and then there are kind of some analogous hurdles as far as documentation goes. Um, so the, um, the underlying text for our online documentation is written in this restructured text format, which I've used it for a while and I still find it extremely awkward. Um, so that's also a new thing to learn. We also use Sphinx, which compiles the restructured text into web pages. And of course, there's a different online platform called Read the Docs um, that we've been plugging 
heavily for the last day and a half. Um, we also ran into some issues with cross-platform compatibility, um, which is kind of what Python is supposed to fix. It's, it should, the same code with the same version should run the same way. Um, so there are some lessons learned with version control. So different versions of certain Python packages may or may not produce the same results. We've, we've, we've worked through a lot of those issues along the way. Um, and then something for me to manage this, this GitHub effort is just um, uh, kind of rolling with the punches and sort of dealing with how the code is evolving as well as the requirements for that code is evolving. Um, so now moving on to the actual documentation. So this is what um, ties together everything we're doing on the GitHub all in one place. My idea is for this is that it's living documentation. So after September 30th, it's not like this goes away. It's, I hope that this is something that team members will continue to, to use and develop and look back on as a reference. Um, so I think of it as a living document that will continue to grow and improve. Uh, so the website um, outline is, is presented here. It, it gives us a summary of the MMC project in the last seven years, um, it goes through the case studies, which I think has the most useful content. And I'll walk through that in the subsequent slides. Um, so Swift, W52, the Fino cases, and NYSERDA, and there's some other side studies that um, could be included here as well. And the case studies here in, um, in this outline on the Read the Docs webpage is also mirrored in the GitHub. Uh, input deck repositories. So the Wharf setups repository, for instance, has a folder with nameless for Swift, a folder for nameless for W52 and so on. Um, and then we have a section that talks about the numerical models and then a section dedicated to talking about how we've used the models and improved upon them. And then finally, I've started compiling a master list of our project publications that's referenced within these pages on the site. So um, there's a lot of stuff here um, it's continuing to grow and improve, um, and you can find it at the link uh, shown in the top right. Um, pretty easy to remember, it's just mmc.readthedocs.io. You don't have to worry about the slash en latest or anything like that. That will send you to the right place if you go there. So I just wanted to walk through the, the case studies page as an example of what's on the website. Um, there's a snapshot on the right. Um, so for all the case studies, uh, Pat came up with a common format um, and an outline that all of the discussions about our case studies should follow. So for, it presents an overview. It presents some key highlights for, uh, about the relevance to wind energy. So we're dealing with a case that's not stationary. Uh, downscaling of energy is important. So maybe a little bit of preaching to the choir for this group, but definitely if somebody and the community stumbles upon this, I think it'll be good to, to talk about why and how we're doing, how we're doing what we're doing as well as why we're doing it. <clears throat> um, and then we also have a, a box that highlights the techniques that we're applying from MMC. So ensemble modeling, different coupling approaches and within internal coupling specifically, we're looking at two different methods. Um, and then the next section is the model setups. So this, um, gives you a pointer to the uh, companion repository for the Wharf setups. Um, so if you were to click on that link, you would get to a GitHub repository that has um, this organizational structure. So Swift case, and then the, um, sorry, the Swift site, and then the, the case, the inputs for the case of interest. So we have free processing inputs, the model inputs, the sampling, and then sampling inputs as well. So we're not archiving the outputs here. That's more appropriate for um, a resource like the DAP, the A2E Data Archiving Portal. Uh, but we are um, archiving every the bare minimum that's needed to recreate um, the simulations that we've run and the results we've produced. The following section is the data sources. So the idea here is we're describing how we're, in addition to what we're using is how we're using it. Uh, so for this SWIFT study um, that we've ha had a few papers published on, we've used the tower um, at 200 meter met mast and uh, as well as a radar um, that has wind profiles as well as radio acoustic soundings. 
Um, so I, as I described in the text, we use um, we used the radar and time averaged um, tower data to drive the inputs to our microscale simulations. And then we also used uh, statistics of the high frequency data from the tower to validate our, our resolved turbulence. And of course it links to the, um, the actual data source here, uh, which is, I guess it's, a, it's Enus 2014. Um, and then it also links to the notebook um, that will walk through step-by-step uh, how we converted the input data, um, the observational data into simulation input data. Um, so all these links work and I could go into detail if anybody is interested, but I think I just, I'm just, my goal here is to just provide a broad overview. Um, so I won't be um, actually going off of these slides and going into the web pages, but um, these slides are in the, uh, Google Drive that's shared and you can kind of use this as a guide or use the read the docs as a guide and kind of click through at your leisure. Um, and then the last section that's common to um, the case studies is the assessments that we've done. So describing um, a brief description of the work that was done and the references to publications and then a link to the assessment notebooks that in which we did all of the um, uh, post-processing and analysis. Um, so something that's come in really handy if you actually kind of use this whole environment is that we, um, for a paper that Dries Allartz and, I, um, and others wrote, we had just one notebook that had, that just generated every single figure for the paper. Um, so we had comments from reviewers and we just went in and we adjusted this plot. We replotted a different way. We changed the scale. Everything is all in one place. So it's a great reference for us as authors. Um, it's a reference for the team and it's also um, offers transparency for the community if they're interested in really getting into the details. So if a grad student looks at this effort and was like, oh, how did they plot this? Or what exactly did they plot? You know, it's all, it's all out there. Um, so this is kind of a lot of the uh, information I presented, but in a slightly different way. So if we really use this whole framework for both um, data processing, uh, input generation, as well as results post-processing, this is kind of how we would use all of, all of the tools. And it's this isn't, a, an established workflow and each study could be slightly different, but these are kind of where all of the um, capabilities we've developed within the GitHub environment could be useful. So again, processing downloaded data, we have a Python module that helps with that. We have helper functions for data analysis. Um, Pat spent a lot of time developing this pre-processing module so you can actually automatically set, do sweeps of or set up uh, sweeps for sensitivity studies for WARF and we have code to really automate that. Um, and then, yeah, we have our own version of MMC WARF. Um, we did not archive Sophie here because that that code predates the MMC project and already lives in, in another um, GitHub organization. Um, and then, yeah, post-processing, we have utilities for working with WARF outputs such as the virtual towers, the TSLS output. Um, and then we have tools that will do the data conversion to go from uh, mesoscale inputs to, uh, or sorry, observational data or mesoscale outputs into SOAP and mes uh, microscale inputs um, and so on and so forth. So this is another view uh, of kind of the work that's been done by the team into really growing this framework, this analysis and, documentation framework, let's say. Um, and then one thing I really wanna highlight um, since uh, we, we are interested in assessment of, of physics as well as our um, mesomicro coupling capabilities. So the effort that Jeff's leading, we, we spent a lot of time building uh, a template to facilitate intercomparisons. So we have this plug and play template that gives you a dashboard of how the turbulence flow 
a, tur a turbulent flow is developing as you move from left to right from the inlet, what the fetch looks like. You can see the, the development of um, the variance and other uh, turbulence properties such as skewness over time as you progress downstream. Um, so this automates the plotting of all of these spectra and uh, statistical analyses. So code that any one particular engineer might have spent an afternoon on, we have a notebook that you can just plug your data in, into and it'll just generate all of these descriptive statistics. Um, and we can, again, have more confidence that we're doing apples to apples comparisons uh, between team members. Um, so to sum up, um, we've developed this, you know, I've called it a framework, a capability. It's really a living repository of kind of everything we we're doing and have done to date. Uh, my hope and intention is for this to be useful and continue to grow and develop. So it's a living repository. The read the docs is a living document. <clears throat> um, the GitHub components um, in some limited capacity, I expect that they'll be jointly maintained by the participating labs and the remainder of this project, as well as in, um, in the follow on efforts. And then I think this is a really useful project management framework um, that I'd be happy to discuss more. Um, so I think if we had adopted this from day one and planned to have training and set everybody's expectations about, okay, this is how you structure your work and this is how we're gonna archive it. Um, this is how you're gonna document everything along the way. I think that would have made this, um, this come together even more nicely. And I think the, everything I've shown today would have been even more uh, fully developed. Um, we did do a, a verification exercise where different team members uh, picked up the archived input um, input text from either the WARF setups or the SOFA setups repositories and tried to replicate each other's um, simulation outputs. Um, so that's something that we could have been doing earlier on, but we we eventually did nonetheless. Um, so that's something I'm pretty happy about that this, this whole GitHub um, environment allows us to more easily do inner comparisons like that, as well as code verification. Um, and I think all of this could be a means to facilitate stakeholder engagement. Um, and um, dare I say, this could be an alternative to annual reporting. So we can actually reduce some of our overall workload if we're documenting along the way in this living format. Um, so I'd love to hear about, you know, whether, if, whether or not people believe um, the GitHub is truly useful or if, if it could be improved. Um, so yeah, any feedback? Uh, would be great. Yeah, I'd be happy to take any questions you have. And that's all I got. Thanks, Elliot. That was a great overview of all the documentation. Really, thanks to you and Pat for leading um, this initiative. I think it really does leave something of real value from this project. And you're also making some great suggestions for some of the follow-on projects as they start, how they might be even more effective um, and use our experience in developing these things. Um, so for the audience, I'd, I'd, we'd love to have your uh, comments and questions. Please either put them in the chat or raise your hand. Um, you know, how many of you have had a chance to go in and look at the GitHub or the read the docs already? Um, and as Elliot said, we'd love to have your feedback on what you think is, is done well versus what could be improved on. Any comments from anybody? So Elliot, you started um, going on some suggestions for, um, you know, how if we had thought of it at the beginning of the project, or six years ago was a long time, we could have done it even better. But right now, we're planning to start various new projects going forward. What are your recommendations for these new projects to end up with GitHub, read the docs, whatever types of documentation might be ideal? Yeah, I think the, the main thing is just planning for it. So if we do for whatever follow on project or new project research effort altogether, I think you should just 
make sure everybody on the team is on the same page as far as, okay, we want to document everything to this level of detail. Um, you know, this, I think we, we found a pretty good middle ground between too much and too little detail. Too much detail requires too much effort from the team. Um, too little detail, it's, I'm not sure it'll be useful, but I think having teasers in the documentation for um, publications, I think that would, that is something that could definitely be really useful or, or just to, I guess, in, increase your, your Google page rank. I think having documentation that, that points to publications, I think that's generally a good thing, but I think just overall setting expectations of the team and then not, um, I think, I think for the, this isn't a criticism, but I think for this, this project, a lot of the work was done and then we were going back and then filling in the details after the fact. But I think just um, doing that in the opposite order. So this is what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And um, and then just incorporating the documentation early on. And I think as we get more, as more people get more comfortable with um, GitHub, then I think all of this becomes much easier. So I think a lot of us had, uh, this was a learning opportunity for a lot of us. And and as I said in the beginning, it's a really powerful and useful tool for software development, but I don't think anybody on this call is necessarily a software engineer by training. So there's, there's a, so I think we're, we're still learning how to best use these resources. Mm -hmm. Okay, Julie Lundquist comments that she's really looking forward to using these notebooks in the classroom, and that will train our future colleagues, um, you know, so they could have wider uses. Um, Min Zhu asks, is there any plan to provide training to the pl public, for example, for a specific experiment in the associated code use? Will you take questions and provide support about the code use, et cetera? So I don't think we have any immediate plans to have a formal training session. I think this, to a certain extent, this workshop is uh, does serve that purpose. Um, but this kind of goes in, it is along the lines of how the GitHub will evolve over time. So the GitHub does have an issues page that kind of allows people to pose questions and and the team will will, depending on how much you opt into notifications and emails, the team will see those questions. And so we can definitely um, generate productive discussion on the GitHub. Um, so I think that would be a place to start. Um, as far as how, whether that catches on or not, I think it depends on the bandwidth of everybody on this call to, um, to be able to uh, follow on and engage with the community after this project ends. Yes, and just as a follow up to that, um, Min, as we were planning this symposium, we did debate whether to go through some of the details. We weren't sure what folks wanted, and we ended up with the format you've been seeing over the last couple of days instead, where we presented a lot of our techniques and results while at the same time pointing you to the GitHub and providing opportunities for Q&A along the way. So, um, you know, continue to ask questions. This particular project team will be dispersing at the end of this month, but many of us will be engaged in follow-on projects that you'll be hearing about in the near future. Um, will Lossman put in here, how much work resources will be required to properly maintain these tools after the project ends? Yeah, and I think, I think the answer is minimal. Now that, I mean, the, all, all the code is, is all out there. All the documentation is all, is all um, uh, publicly available and anybody can, at this point, I think it's incremental changes. It's not building a whole new repository. Um, I think at this point, it, it'll be pretty minimal. 
Okay. Um, well, thanks, Elliot, uh, both for your work, for your uh, great talk, and answering a lot of questions, as well as visioning uh, ways we can do this better in the future. I think that's very pertinent to the leaders of the follow-on teams. Um, let's go ahead and move on to the next talk. Um, Larry Berg of PNNL is going to summarize what we've done over the course of this project and talk a little bit about how there's going to be continuity beyond the end of the month when the project formally ends. Larry? And wouldn't you know that I... Let's see, Amy, do you would oh, oh. be prepared in case? Yeah, I think we might need Amy. I'm getting an error from Zoom, and I wonder if, if I actually need to upload my, um, upload a new version of Zoom. Oh, now yeah, it seems I'm, to be doing better. Oh. I'm not sure what was up. There we Are go. Are you good now? I think so, okay. if, assuming, that, assuming that you can see it. Yes. Yep. Very good. Um, yes, yeah, so as you said, I'm Larry Berg. Um, I've been asked to kind of provide a wrap up and summary um, of, of the project that, that we've all been working very hard on. Um, the hard part as I went through this is Shannon gets the fun of talking about the follow on projects in the next talk. So um, I'll, I'll be saving that for him. The other thing I want to point out is this talk really, um, I think, should be given by Colleen Call. She's been the PNLPI on the project over the last several years. And unfortunately, she wasn't able to attend this meeting, um, but she has certainly been an important part of the project team. So I started by reflecting a little bit, and, and that's kind of fun because it's, it's really not very often, as, as we've all gotten very, very busy, um, to have much time to reflect. So I actually went back to the proposal that we wrote back in 2015. And in there, we listed the MMC approaches that were in, in vogue at the moment. So running mesoscale, and LES um, simulation simultaneously. You saw images similar to this um, earlier in the symposium, but these are the actual figures that were in our proposal. Um, and then we also talked in the proposal about offline coupling, where we're using separate mesoscale and microscale modeling that we can um, force either at the boundaries or um, more with body forcing terms. So that's really what we laid out in the proposal. Um, we also inter listed a number of technology barriers. So these were really the things that we felt like we um, wanted to address. And I was somewhat relieved as I looked over these technology barriers to see how well they map um, to the work that we actually did over the lifespan of the, of the project. Um, so the barriers we identified then were sharing a flow information between the mesoscale and microscale domains, uh, the generation of microscale turbulence um, I shouldn't say the generation of microscope turbulence on the, on the microscale domains themselves. Surface layer parameterizations for high resolution simulations, um, high resolution PBL parameter, parameterizations, and then observations to support MMC. So I think that we've heard a lot about, a lot of progress on these topics um, over the last two days. Um, Elliot just provided a, a really nice overview um, in terms of, of the software packages and the software tools that, that we've um, developed for the as part of the project. Um, he had a figure very similar to this one uh, in what he showed, but the project GitHub site, the Jupyter notebooks for analysis, things that really can be used across the community. Um, Raj yesterday talked about strategies for dealing with Terry Incognita. Um, I'm really focusing on the need to avoid horizontal grid spacing close to the boundary layer depth. And I just repeat this figure um, here. If you look at the panels on the right, um, particularly in the upper right, you can see the wiggles that get much larger um, as the boundary, as the grid spacing becomes smaller than the boundary layer depth. So pointing to some of the things that we need to be um, concerned about, particularly in this case, when we were using the MYNN parameterization. And I think it's important for us to share some of these results across the community. Uh, we heard a lot about um, the perturbation approaches. Um, so really using perturbations to help reduce the domain size that spinning up turbulence more quickly. And we just have some examples here um, that I took from an earlier um, presentation. So the top panel with no turbulence generation and the bottom two panels, um, one with stochastic temperature perturbations and the bottom one with the man method. And then we using some of our tools, we can look at, at how some of these different methods perform. And in this case, I'm just showing the um, velocity distribution, the PDF of the velocity at various depths into the domain. And you can see, as we kind of look at that, um, 
Miami Dolphins turquoise and then the, the um, rusty red, how similar those two distributions look at different dif distances into the domain. And, and really learning that um, using of these use of these perturbations is, is very advantageous. Um, we heard some from Matt today and, and from um, yesterday in terms of the, the gravity waves. And I think it's it's important to think about when, when are gravity waves real, when are gravity waves spurious. Um, and this is just some examples um, that were presented yesterday. Um, and then we heard from Matt today about how to apply damping to reduce the impacts of waves on the simulation. So looking at their case in complex terrain. Um, I think for those of us that are meteorologists, the presence of gravity waves is not really surprising at all. And just as an example, um, to remind ourselves that they can be real, I, I have here a time series that was in a paper that Carolina Droxel published back in 2021. This is actually work that was part of the W52 project, so I don't want to confuse things um, too much there. But in this case, you can see in the black line, so the solid black line is actually wind speed measured at uh, wind turbines and a wind farm in the Columbia Gorge. Um, the dashed line is the wind speed from wharf, and then the red line is the turbine power. And this is actually a day that we know we had gravity waves in the region. We could see it in um, MODIS satellite images, so it was showing up in the clouds. And you can see these relatively rapid oscillations in the power, where we basically go from um, the rated power, which is somewhere between 2 and 2.5 megawatts, um, down in some cases below 1 megawatt over a relatively small time window. So certainly, um, these gravity waves are real, and there's instances where we really want to make sure that we're capturing them accurately in our simulations. We heard a lot about the model improvements, um, so the development of a 3D boundary layer parameterization, so really helping us better account for the horizontal, um, horizontal terms in the TKE budget and looking for a better treatment of turbulence and relatively small horizontal grid spacing and in regions of complex terrain. Um, today, we heard about treatments um, new treatments for to improve Monty and Obukov similarity theory. So we saw results um, from some of the machine learning approaches from um, David, John, and, and Susan. So here, um, just repeating some of their plots, the top um, Monty and Obukov results from Monty and Obukov similarity, the bottom row from neural networks, and looking at differences in both the friction velocity and the heat fluxes in those simulations. So thinking more carefully about how we apply some of these parameterizations. And then we also saw um, a very interesting talk today by Susan, um, looking at how we can generate fine scale um, structures using machine learning. So taking a relatively coarse LES using um, <clears throat> various machine learning approaches to help us understand and come up with a higher resolution um, value or estimates of the wind speed at a much lower computational cost than is possible with standard LES. We have a number of case studies for community use and, and Elliot pointed these out in some of the documents that, that he has prepared. Um, so really case studies for evaluating the performance of coupled models. Um, so we have land-based and simple and complex terrain. So I have a picture up on the upper right that shows the SWIFT facility in the Texas Panhandle. It's probably about as simple as terrain as you can get. And then we also did quite a bit of work with data from um, W52, the second wind forecast improvement project that was based um, in the Columbia Basin in Washington and Oregon. And we're now expanding and studying offshore. We started with Fino, um, developed a case study for that. That was largely because we have data available. Um, now we're turning to the Atlantic. Um, we've made use of some of the LIDAR buoy data from NYSERDA and DOE and getting ready for a, a major field study that I'm sure Shannon's going to talk about um, in the slide deck that he's presenting next. Um, one of the things that, that I think has been important um, across the project, or across the life of the project, um, is really coupling um, the simulations that we're doing with high quality data sets, really focusing on the validation. Um, Sue mentioned BNB being important in the project, and, and we really looked hard for cases where we had the data that we needed, and, and really data that we could use to evaluate the turbulence properties. So in many cases, we um, identified cases where we have tower data with sonic, sonic anemometers or other measurement systems, and then more recently been doing more with remote sensing systems, so primarily um, Doppler LiDAR at a number of different locations, either the LiDAR buoys um, and even some interesting studies um, in the Columbia Basin, and we have a paper that we're actually working on getting out. Raj is working on looking at some of the details of the flow structures that can only be revealed really with a scanning Doppler LiDAR, so there's some exciting work yet to come out. Um, as we've mentioned many times, the MMC project is ending, but the work that we've been doing to better understand 
um, the physics that are important for wind energy and wind energy applications um, will continue in a, in a whole new suite of projects that Shannon will talk about next. So then just to reiterate and, and build largely on what Elliot talked about, how can you leverage the progress um, that's been made so far? Um, as mentioned several times, we have these case studies and we really developed the case studies with the idea um, that they're for community use. Um, so you've seen some about the AT, A2E MMC version of WARF and some of the things that are available there, the MMC tools that are there and ready um, to use, and then model setups for both land-based and offshore cases to meet um, whatever needs you might have. So these are all there. All the data sets involved are public. Um, so there's no question or no issues um, with data sharing. And I'll just repeat um, the GitHub site here from that Elliot shared and has been shared in other presentations earlier. Um, we made significant contributions to the peer reviewed literature and we also have some annual um, project reports. Um, Sue mentioned the BAMS paper that was published in 2019. And I think that's a really good um, jumping off point provides a nice high level overview of what we've been doing in the project and can point you to some of the papers that have more specific details. A similar paper or paper of similar scope is currently being drafted um, that we hope will appear in wind energy science and will serve largely the same role, a way to help you quickly see um, where some of the key research is and allow you provide the links that you need um, to dive more into the other research that we have. Um, so that's my last slide. I, I know I was quick. Um, but I wanted to leave plenty of time for questions. And I think at this point too, it'd be fair to ask any questions you might have for, for any of the, um, related to any of the talks that you've seen over the last couple of days. Well, thanks, Larry. <clears throat> thanks, Larry. What a, a great way of looking at it from the original proposal through what we've accomplished. And um, I must admit, I haven't read that proposal in a long time. And the figures from it um, are quite interesting given what we have learned and how much complexity uh, we've ended up with in the project versus what we thought we needed to do. Right. Um, so we're opening up uh, both the chat and uh, the opportunity to raise your hand um, so that we can answer questions either really on anything in the project at this point. And I think the you know rest of the project team can come in if there's anything appropriate for them as well. Okay, uh, Jamal from Entercon is asking a general question to you, Larry, and to the audience. MMC methods seem to be currently applied to single event, extreme wind conditions, and ultimate loads. How would you apply MMC to more general wind resource assessment and fatigue loads? In other words, how would you reduce several years of mesoscale data to say a representative day for 36 wind directions? <laughs> good question. Yeah, that, that that is a good question. And I and I think that's one of the challenges that, that I think we have struggled with some um, in the project. And I think it it points really to some of the computational expense of uh, running the models that that we um, were using, particularly some of the large eddy simulation. Um, really the the number of case studies was ultimately limited both by computational resources and and, and to some extent bandwidth of the of the project team members. I think you know, to kind of help address this question, though, one of the things that's exciting is seeing um, some of those machine learning applications that can be used um, to downscale the information much more rapidly. So I think that would enable us um, to expand what we're able to do and look at much longer um, time series than, than is possible now. And I think would, would allow us to construct a more realistic um, um, typical, typical meteorological year or something of that nature that could be used. Um, we've also, I think, worked hard to not just focus on extreme events. Um, I think we've also looked at some pretty typical cases. We tried to look at cases um, with frontal passages, but those those were we were selected more in the context of a situation with changing conditions rather than being focused on um, particularly extreme conditions. So in, in that sense, I think some of the work we're doing is is likely representative of of more conditions than you might anticipate. I don't know if anybody else on the team has anything they would like to add. I guess one thing that I would like to point out is a representative day for any particular location might not actually exist. One thing that we've learned 
as part of this project and beyond is that variability really needs to be considered. Um, you know, it, stability on, you know, of course, in a diurnal cycle on a quote unquote typical day, you might um, get, you know, you might evolve from stable through neutral to convective and back. Um, but there, there's also days where you have frontal passages or low-level jets at night versus other days you don't. So um, all these characteristics need to be considered. I think Jeff is going to add on. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to um, maybe augment a little bit that beyond the machine learning stuff, which is definitely very promising, DOE is also investing in a whole new software stack um, to enable the next generation of high performance computing to uh, do lots of really high fidelity full physics uh, simulations as well. So that's another approach. And this might be a good time for team members to um, you know, provide their opinions perhaps on some of what is needed and how we can contribute to you know, their long-term re resource assessment as Larry brought up some of the machine learning issues are very critical as well. And Min Ju um, just asked, do you think as per the current status, how far away from finding the best MMC approach for wind resource assessment, how far are we away? Yeah, I can take a, a first crack at that. And then there, I'm sure there are others in the team. And um, it, it makes me think of Bronco's comment when I asked him the question of what surprised him the most, and it was how complicated it is. And I, I think as we started the project, we had envisioned that we would get to a point where we could really recommend a um, specific model configuration or some other things that would help um, really, really provide this best way to do it. Um, I think we've, we've discovered it to be more complicated. Um, than that, and you know, I think as we were looking at, at all those simulations from the um, off the northeast over the Atlantic, right? There's certainly um, we're far from being able to just turn the crank. Um, having said that, though, I think there are some important rules of thumb that we can provide that were related to um, grid spacings that avoid Terry incognita, the use of um, your favorite flavor of perturbations. We never, I, I'm not sure we understand yet if one kind of perturbation is clearly superior to the others, but using the perturbations is a good way um, to spin up turbulence more quickly and get more real, realistic turbulence. Um, so I think there is some guidance there. And I think two, being aware of um, the presence of, of potentially spurious gravity waves that could be influencing um, simulations in some of the model configurations um, we use. But Pat, is you wanna add something? Yeah, I was just gonna say, I think, depending on how you define best is the key here because it's what's best for your situation or the, the problem that you're looking at. So um, I for over the ocean, for example, if you can get away with assuming that it's kind of homogeneous, you can run these fairly cheap periodic simulations and probably get a pretty good uh, accurate answer. Um, but if your situation is not and any means homogeneous, then you're not going to be able to get away with that. You'll have to use a different technique. And it's just all going to be very dependent. So I think there's never going to be a one size fits all approach for this. But I think just based on individual uh, cases, or maybe not case in terms of like a, a case study, but just for a, a single problem, there's going to be maybe a best approach for that one problem. So it might just take some some initial thinking uh, ahead of time to figure out what approach would probably be best for you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Pat. That that was um, nice and insightful. Anybody else have comments to add, Matt? I was looking at the <clears throat> I was looking at the the question in the chat from Jamal, the one that we read before, which I think is really interesting. Um, he's, he's saying, how do you, how do you apply all this stuff that, that we've been applying for kind of single events to fatigue and, and things that require long, long times? Um, and I think that's a really good question. And I, I wanted to, wanted to address it because I think that 
I think we haven't come up with a microscale, mesoscale microscale coupling method. We've come up with a bunch of methods. And I think we've realized through this process that there's all sorts of different applications. And that what you say there in the chat, like how do you do fatigue loads? Um, that's a really great application where, where the method would look different. It may be that you, maybe that you run Dwarf and you pick out representative sets, you know, some ensemble of representative days for a site. And then you run profile assimilation driven LES to generate turbulence for all those different situations. And then you have a whole suite of turbulence that you could then run through a loads analysis. Um, I think you could do some really, really useful site specific sort of analysis with what we've learned here. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Matt. Um, any further thought? Yeah, this is Jeff. Um, I'll just share a thought from a related project. We have uh, near Livermore, there's a test facility that's really close to the Altamont wind farm. And we have some kind of parallel ridges. They're not quite as you know geometrically simple as, as the ones in Pertigau. But our, our wind rose is, has a couple of predominant flow directions, and most of it's southwesterly, and that's actually perpendicular to those ridge lines. And if you, we put LIDARs out there, and you do not get the logarithmic increase of wind speed that you would expect because sort of an internal, almost like an internal boundary layer develops. Um, so you have actually negative shear. You get a really quick speed up, you know, within a few tens of meters of the surface, and then it slows down. Whereas when the flow is, transverse or aligned with the ridges, then you get the standard logarithmic sort of thing. So, you know, as we expand wind energy into more complicated locations, um, site-specific <laughs> uh, research is really, really going to be required. And, um, you know, how, how we do that uh, efficiently is, is, is yet to be determined, but at least I think we, we, we do have some, some knowledge about what to look out for and some guidance on how some of these different workflows may be, be applicable to help things along. Yeah, and it's amazing how we've moved past, um, you know, the engineering view of the atmosphere of being a logarithmic profile and really having the rich structure, the variability that depends on site, on stability, on you know, the canopy, everything, you know, the terrain around proximity to water bodies, et cetera. Um, you know, there, there's been a lot happening. A few years ago, um, Paul Veers, of course, one of the leaders of wind turbine engineering, um, he, led a, a, an edited, actually two volume set, looking at the complexity of the whole series from uh, you know, general circulation of the atmosphere to turbulence modeling, um, you know, in through how to model loads, wakes, you know, impacts on down. And this team contributed to some of the atmospheric science chapters. And I think that's really a good way to look at how complexity has really come into our thinking of what is needed to optimize um, wind generation. You know, it used to be that we just wanted to put turbines out there, you know, captured most of the wind, but now we're trying to optimize, design better turbines, design better ways to site uh, wind farms, et cetera. Um, any other comments from either team members or audience before we move forward? I guess just one more comment on this, and I think Jeff alluded to this too, but the advancement of GPU-based uh, solvers is going to be a, a big game changer. We've already seen it. Um, also unrelated study with, with Pertigau of running um, an offline coupled uh, fast study simulation with Wharf, uh, where what fast study was able to do in 12 hours, it took, I think, 12 days for, for Wharf to even come close to, to matching it. So Advances like that will help to do a lot more generalized LES simulations um, as opposed to just a quick six hour study. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Pat. You know, pointing out some of the you know GPU resident codes that 
are in the midst of being developed and can include some of the aspects we want at both the mesoscale and the micro scale. And as Larry already pointed out, the machine learning and the promise of um, you know, doing the downscaling from the mesoscale to the micro scale directly um, in a matter of seconds, what used to take weeks uh, you know, to simulate at high resolution. I think, um, you know, there, the technology going forward, uh, you know, the, the um, hardware as well as the software uh, is enabling us to do all of this better. Right, and I, and I think that software stack that Jeff mentioned was, I remember some, some MMC project team meetings where we were batting ideas around um, that ultimately led to that project. So I think, um, it, it highlights how we can take what we're learning in projects like this, work with DOE, and secure funding to develop some of the additional tools we need. And I might just add one thing that, you know, I don't think it's machine learning versus, you know, the full physics codes. It's really a bootstrapping between the two um, to give us the, the best applicability for, for whatever workflow we need. Bronco? Uh, yeah, just to add to that, uh, I fully agree that full physics codes will still be needed, if nothing else, for training of machine learning. Uh, so, and having them perform as uh, best as possible, as fast as possible, is, is definitely a need for that. So I think the, the codes that are being developed right now, um, Exabind and ERP uh, energy research forecasting model uh, will uh, provide that capability. Okay. Any further comments or any last thoughts? Well, speaking of moving forward, let's go ahead and uh, move into the next session, which is Shannon da Davis, a technology lead at DOE's Wind Energy Technology Office. He's going to tell us about what DOE has planned for next steps in the research that's going to enable uh, better atmospheric sciences for wind energy. Shannon? Thanks, Sue. Let's see. that coming through? It is now, yes. All right. Let's see if we can get on presentation mode. One second. Yep. How about now? Looks great, Shannon. Fantastic. So uh, yeah, thanks Sue for the intro, and and uh, I just really want to say thank you to um, and acknowledge the the entire uh, MMC team. Um, it's just been uh, an amazing effort to take a research project and to end up forging new directions in both CFD and atmospheric science. Um, it's uh, uh, just been most impressive, and I really want to also thank all the attendees that are here today. Um, uh, this we do this uh, to engage with you. Um, this is really a, a, a two-way interaction that we're shooting for. Um, so we, the, the feedback is is more than welcome, and we hope that continues after the symposium. Um, we really uh, uh, value everything that's been uh, all the exchange so far, and, and are, are uh, hungering for more. Um, I'd like to acknowledge. Uh, I think Larry touched on an MMC here who has been invaluable. That's not here today. Um, Dr. Colleen Call, she's away on maternity leave after delivering a wonderful package a, a couple weeks ago, as rumor has it. Um, that one's not going to be freely available on our GitHub page, um, but uh, we, we wish her well and, and, and want to just acknowledge how all the work that's, that she's done and, and uh, how we've presented it here today. Another person I'd like to recognize who's lurking in the background there is uh, Dr. Mike Robinson. Um, Mike is the dynamo, along with Mike Derby, that's made this $100 million a year effort for A2E possible. Um, Mike, if you want to turn on your camera, that'd be great. Um, uh, we just uh, just want to say how profoundly grateful we are for all the effort, and it's hard to fathom how much effort it has been, uh, but uh, just that's greatly appreciated. Um, so let me offer a few closing thoughts. Uh, 
MMC, the MMC work is really the embodiment of an underlying credo uh, in wind energy science. And that's that you adopt what you can use from other uh, from leading efforts in other fields. That could be engineering, it could be CFD, it could be atmospheric science, ocean science, et cetera. You adapt it to your application. And then when you, in, in that, that, that uh, as Bronco eloquently put it, the devil is in the details. You have to innovate like crazy to make it work at, at the end. Um, and we've seen, and actually, yeah, don't, I don't want to forget the most crucial ingredient of all is to collaborate, exchanging back and forth between each other, which has been uh, the camaraderie that has been shown in this particular team with, within, within the team, and as well as to industry and academic partners has just been amazing. Um, and it's just, just something, a model that we're trying to emulate in, in other aspects of the program. So we, let me see, this. there we go. Sorry, can't see my own slides here. Um, so yesterday we and today we've, we've discussed how the MMC efforts have manifested in other projects across the DOE portfolio. Um, one of these includes the Wind Corp Forecasting Improvement Project uh, 2, um, or WFIP 2. Um, this project, we were able to showcase how the MMC applications could be used in complex terrain, immersed boundary layer method, 3D PBL scheme development, and how, how the, it improved uh, the capturing of ramp and cold pool events. Um, as this project is, uh, is winding down this fiscal year as well, um, it's important to remember that uh, I'll, I'll, I'll quote the great American uh, uh, philosopher, Yogi Berra, it's not over till it's over. So um, we're already at work with what we call Wind Forecasting Improvement Project 3. Um, we may lose points for our originality in naming the project, but this is gro fastly growing into an amazing effort that's going to include multi-scale modeling, uh, a very expansive array of observations, including at sea observations in the, the Martha's Vineyard wind lease region off the Atlantic coast. Where um, there'll be engagement on the MMC from the MMC project members on both sides. Um, this was, is partially uh, the offshore wind effort from DOE merging with a, an offshore uh, 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 funding opportunity award awarded to a team led by Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and comprised of academic partners, including CU, Tufts, um, U University of Texas, Dallas, and industry partners like EMVGL. Um, this, we're expecting to see a lot more of, of the developments of the 3D PBL feasibility in an offshore context, especially the, the different uh, uh, ranges of stability uh, in the, off the Atlantic coast. Um, we'll be looking at the air sea turbulence and, uh, and turbulent interactions offshore, as well as low level jets that Pat um, described uh, in his talk earlier today. Um, some more uh, closer examination of the internal boundary layer development and coastal processes, and um, mesoscale improvements to the resource characterization. We're also heavily engaged in. in, uh, in uh, Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, we're also heavily engaged on in, in improving the understanding of uh, wake interactions and interray effects and in terms of land-based winds. This is occurring through the, the American Wake Experiment or Awaken, uh, which is centered amongst uh, a large group of wind farms in the Oklahoma, Texas, Southern Great Plains region. Uh, it's also in collaboration with our partners from the, from the Office of Science, the Atmospheric Radiation Measurement Facility. Um, located in, in Oklahoma. The, the de deployment of um, instruments for this project is already underway and there will be um, multi, like the WFIP experiments, there'll be multi-fidelity modeling as well as uh, observations from, from uh, the rotor scale to, and blade scale to um, the mesoscale uh, uh, inflow and outflow. They'll be looking, using the uh, immersed boundary methods, 3D PBL, and looking at the inflow and wake turbulence. We'll be looking at blockage events at multi-scales, low-level jets, over land, uh, um, turbine parameterizations for use in LES and mesoscale models, among other applications. That brings us to the end of what's going on at present. Um, but uh, as uh, as Elliot kind of hinted to, in it to in his talk, um, tomorrow is only a few weeks away. Um, as we begin the next fiscal year, we're already planning uh, the next set of research projects. Um, and to meet the, the ambitious deployment and decarbonization goals that Mike Derby spoke of yesterday, we're adding efforts to access new deployment regions where the resource may be greater aloft and turbines may be uh, mounted on tall towers and the surrounding regions may be characterized by heterogeneous uh, surface times, surface 
uh, types and diverse canopy uh, types as well. This project is gonna be launched. Uh, so we'll be targeting specifically the Appalachian uh, low wind regions uh, that are gonna be, that we would observe in the, in the Southeast. Um, we'll be using a number of the, the MMC tools and we'll start the work on this uh, later and um, hopefully in, within the next couple of months in 2023 and on through 2026. We'll also be taking a look at the more challenging um, a, a prospect of developing the wind resource off the west coast and the deeper deeper um, waters. We we're, we'll be trying to support uh, floating offshore wind deployments. Let's get, we have a project called observationally driven resource assessment and coupled models, which has a large contingent of this current MMC team merging with our our lighter buoy science team and um, and WFIP three team to uh, to explore what's unique about the U.S. West Coast and the open Pacific waters and from our um, Previous boy deployments, we found that there's a lot of interesting physics, um, the, a function of the the, uh, the different uh, weather regimes and the wave interactions at hub heights, as well as other unique interactions from the bathymetry and coastline geometry. And as as the penetration of wind to the grid increases and and it, reliability becomes more of an issue, we're also very aware of how we have to address. Uh, extreme weather and uh, extreme or severe weather with extreme weather events um, applied, particularly to offshore wind. Um, we're going to be launching a project, uh, actually a series of projects. One will be looking at the atmospheric science side, while another one will be looking at the design and um, uh, and high fidelity modeling side. Um, the location of this will be the Atlantic uh, coast and the Gulf of Mexico. We'll be looking at processes embedded in extreme weather events, which which can contribute to extreme wind and veer uh, cases. Uh, we'll be looking at hurricanes as well as nor'easters and, and overall extreme weather events. And in addition to this, we're also taking a, a bite at, as, as, um, as the conversation was ta tapering off just before my talk. Um, with, uh, we're looking at um, the next generation of, of, of numerical CFD tools that we need to have on hand to be able to tackle some of the challenges that are facing uh, deployment as well as on, our improved understanding for reliability. These projects include what we call the Energy Research and Forcing, Forecasting Model, which is ERF, and the Exawin suite of tools, which uh, features our high fidelity modeling. Um, this, these, both of these tools are, will be designed, are being designed to, to, func to function on the HPC exascale environment. So they'll be able, they'll be GPU enhanceable. Um, this is to, um, I'm, uh, you can. I don't mind the boos and jeers if, as far as uh, you know, Wharf is has been a profoundly powerful tool and had an has an incredible impact on the atmospheric science community, but um, it's just a little dated. And so we're we're working on very much trying to improve the performance of of the next generation of tools and having that capability on hand. Um, and that that work is already underway. As a number of the PIs for these products are all, I know, I notice are all on the call, they're welcome to jump in and, and add any clarification. But at this point, I'm glad to take any questions on where we're going with this roadmap. Um, again, uh, just profoundly grateful for the effort that this team has put in, the results that they've achieved, and uh, as well as the, all the interaction with the audience, um, the, um, the attendees, just this has been a fantastic, fantastic exercise. And um, per some of the questions that were asked earlier, I mean, we um, we would like to get your feedback on how to make these tools more um, more easy to implement in your own particular applications of need. Um, so I, and if in, just in case there weren't enough questions, I, I I put a few out there for for questions that would inform our decisions and our our next steps um, and facilitate any discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon, and thanks so much for your support and WIDO's support throughout this project. And I will add your thanks to Mike Robinson. Um, you know, it really was his brainchild and he has supported us the whole way along. Um, so questions, comments for Shannon or responses to Shannon's questions. Uh, feel free to use either the chat or raise your hand in Zoom. We'd love to hear from the audience, what are the implementations and barriers to implementing MMC tools in using? Um, you know, we had some conversation last time about 
um, you know, needing to do resource assessment. Um, how do you currently do it? And what would your vision be on how you'd like to do it? We'd love to hear from either the audience or team members, um, you know, thinking through visions. Nick Smith. Hi, Shannon. I'm going to rephrase a question I asked during during Pat's talk, um, which is related to observational data to validate models. Um, one of the challenges, especially in the offshore environment, is the lack of turbulent information offshore to validate models. Um, what is, does DOE have a, a thought on how to address that uh, with new technologies or measurement platforms. Um, the the ACIT tower was mentioned, which I think is at 27 meters, but that's a, a great resource, but significantly uh, lower than the sort of 100 and something meters that we're considering for hub height. Right, right. No, that's a great question, Nick, and, I, and uh, I'm glad you asked. Um, well, the um, wind forecasting improvement project three um, will be, I mean, we're. In short, we're, we're we're doing targeted approaches to to to, to meeting the, the the needs that you described. Um, w three is one of those. Where we will have a platform uh, with a mini ACET tower on a barge uh, offshore in the lease region itself. Um, we'll have uh, uh, scanning lidars. We'll have uh, wind profilers. Um, we're going to deploy the light the our, the DOE lidar buoys um, as part of this project um, and have multiple ship transects through launching. Um, Assans, as well as doing LiDAR scans. Um, that's that's just one particular case of data. I mean, in more broadly speaking, we're we're in the midst of, of uh, quadrupling the size of our buoy fleet uh, to, to provide um, long-term measurements in the key regions of uh, the Gulf of Mexico, the Southeast Atlantic, and, and other regions of the West Coast. We're deploying in Hawaii uh, in the next couple of weeks. Um, so uh, we're trying to provide these publicly data, uh, available data sets to help uh, uh, the industry be informed as to as to the, the turbulence as well as the resource nature um, at the heights you're talking about. Uh, there's we're, we're as far as new technologies, we're looking into ways to do, do this in a more automated way. Um, I think there's been some some uh, proposals for AUVs and, and coupled with floating platforms. Um, there's been uh, some discussion with uh, partnering with the Office of Science for a large scale platform movable platform. For in the offshore environment to do these kind of uh, um, measurement studies, uh, it's something that's a critical need. I absolutely agree with you on it, and uh, I would put it as near the top of the priority list. Okay, thank you, Nick and Shannon. Um, Minju um, types one barrier for implementing the advanced MMC, that's LES, WARF, CFD methods, is the computational cost and the actual gain over using simpler methods. So it's a cost benefit analysis for some companies apparently. Um, and just again, for the audience, for Shannon, for anybody, um, how do you see that changing in the next decade? It's, it's uh, funny, so that actually ties into some discussions we're having at headquarters. Um, uh, we're we're looking into making um, HBC more accessible to a broader um, uh, a broader usage um, to uh, and smaller awards um, for uh, to to be able to use the, the tools that we're able to provide because we're we're aware that not everybody has the full array of HBC um, resources that that uh, the government labs do have at their at their fingertips um, and so we're looking into that as a as a as a as a as a major need that that we need to meet. And, uh, and I'm glad to hear that comment because that, that, that helps inform us our decisions. Mm -hmm. This is Philip. I had a question related to this. Um, you mentioned the ERF, the Energy Research and Forecasting Model. Is that, I'm not sure if it's gonna be based on WORF or if it's gonna to be totally separate from WORF. And is there um, any um, thoughts about going to GPUs with it to try to alleviate the computational costs and things like that? Yeah, it, it's not, I mean, it, it's, uh, we, we consult WARF as a reference and, uh, but it is it is based on the AMR 
structure. And uh, I think we have Ann Almgren is on the line, who, who's the who's the uh, creator of the AMR uh, um, uh, code. Um, but uh, if she wants to jump in, that's she could probably say it more eloquently than I can. Um, but it's it's not going to be. It will be fully GPU um, uh, enhanceable, and it's uh, it will not be. It's not a not a rewrite of the of the Wharf code. It's it's going to be um, scalable and and GPU enhanceable. It uh, should be a lot faster. Although it, 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 they're currently that team has been able to um, to to use a lot of the Wharf uh, output or input, um, so that there is some kind of communication available uh, at least in this early stage. And Ali actually is on this project as well, so he could probably speak to the, the details and more. Yeah, this this is Anna. I wasn't planning to <laughs> wasn't planning to turn on my video, so uh, um, the advantages of working at home, right? Um, so yeah, so so Earth is built GPU able in the sense that it's a single code base that will run on CPU or GPU. Um, Elliot and I, one of the questions that I've been thinking about is Elliot and I were actually talking about the there's a target user base of people who automatically can use multiple GPUs on a supercomputer. And there's a target user base of people who might have one GPU on a local, on some kind of desktop. And the, the same code will run on all of those architectures. It will be, you know, it's hard to optimize for all cases. Um, one of the, I, I really appreciate all of the knowledge that is present in the, the, uh, in the talks I've been hearing here. And I, I will say it's daunting to figure out what capabilities to put into Earth. Um, I would love to hear from folks. I'm, I've had a lot of conversations with Jeff and Bronco about, you know, which version of which algorithm should be the first pass. Um, it's something that I'm very much learning as we go. But the idea is to have a performant, um, I'll, let's call it an alternative to WARF. It will never have all of the, um, the features, I suspect. But I would love input on what people view as the most important and, you know, what the target problems are. Um, yeah, we do have Elliot on the call. And maybe some other, and Bronco is our lead there. Um, anybody else wants to chime in? Would Bronco or Elliot interested in um, commenting? Yeah, I don't have too much to add. Um, and you didn't give your, your standard sort of three prong approach feel. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so- I was, I was uh, waiting for that too. <laughs> okay, so, so the, the, in my mind anyway, and, and Shannon hasn't shut me down on this yet, it, we have a three-pronged, um, three-direction, three-bend circles, however we think of it. So one is to provide, let's call it an alternative to war for at least the cases that, that we can support that will run faster on supercomputers. One is um, very specifically a coupling with AMR Wind. So both Earth and AMR Wind are built on the AMRX uh, library, which is something I'm very involved with. And so the data structures are very compatible. And so one of the things that we're actually working on now, um, Bruce Perry at Enrel is, is taking the lead on that, is runtime coupling between Earth and AMR Wind. And we, got, we actually have a prototype in place. And so that will hopefully allow some of the investigation of if we have runtime coupling, we can explore different coupling strategies at runtime. Um, it's not going to be the answer for everything, but it, it, it adds to the excellent code suite in that sense. And then the third is, where I come from, which is, is sort of an algorithm's perspective, I want Earth to be a sandbox for trying out things. Um, there are a lot of interesting coupling ideas that I, I say coupling in a very loose sense, um, you know, how to bridge scales, how to couple different, you know, coupling compressible and incompressible, coupling LES and RANS, all of these things, I would love for Earth to be a sandbox that people could use that um, we're trying to build it in such a way that it is something that, that users could come in and, and play with ideas um, so those are the three the three goals. Um, we're making progress the best we can toward them. We're not there yet. Um, I've also made the statement that for the next year, we're keeping Earth in a relative lockdown mode, which is the developers are having their way with it without worrying about there being users who need um, stability. So for another year, that's the mode that we're in. Uh, hopefully a year from now, we can actually have Earth starting to do some science. And I want to give a shout out to Jeff, who is there for all of my uh, <laughs> uninformed questions. It has been a great resource in this. Okay. Um, speaking of other, that was at the uh, you know meso scale, but there's also a comment from uh, Jamal Adib of Entercon. Uh, it was briefly discussed before I decided to stop using Sofa uh, for more development maintenance and focus really on Exawind. 
And would the MMC code be adapted at some point to ExaWind? Um, let's see, do we have, who's here would like to deal with that? Maybe Matt? Yeah, we're, we're already doing that. We're, we've learned a lot about how to do things in I think a kind of code independent way. So as ExaWind continues to be developed, we add in pieces that, that we've learned here. We'll just keep doing that. Okay, so a lot of these tools will live on, even if not in some of the original codes where they were tested. Any other questions or comments? Michael. Yeah, I, I had a question. Uh, well, I don't know, suggestion, but uh, it seems, you know, some of the efforts really produce a lot of data, you know, some of the large or going forward, you know, this exascale computations and things like that. And I, I want to bring up, so I use the Johns Hopkins turbulence uh, modeling resource quite a bit where they have uh, several canonical uh, direct numerical simulation data packages stored on a, on a cluster and you have really nice interfaces so you can you know, do a lot of the post-processing that's that's costly already on the cluster there and then just transform kind of post-process quantities. So I, I find this a very nice way of how you make the data reusable. I use it in my turbulence class all the time. It's really, it's, it's amazing what you can do with, with very little effort, you know, and so especially bringing things in the classroom, you know, you, you cannot spend weeks just to make one graph that you do for a paper. So the easier it is, I, I feel like the more useful the data is for others. Okay, thanks, useful comment. Definitely. Okay, any further comments, questions, or um, if anybody who is working on some of the future projects, would love to hear your point of view. Um, Jeff, you turned on your camera. Yeah, I just might mention that one of the things that I know we're doing with Earth and I think with other codes in the ExaWind stack is interfacing with HDF5 and um, NetCDF because we recognize that users have a lot of tools that they've built to work with NetCDF. And so we're doing that to streamline access and, and rendering of, of data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, last week um, I was part of a NOAA um, workshop that was emphasizing, well, it was emphasizing AI, but there, there was one of the sessions talking about digital twins. And as we talked about digital twins really combining um, many of the physical modeling principles with uh, the AI principles, it hit me that's exactly what we've been doing in this project. We've been building basically digital twins of particular areas and ways to be able to generalize those to other areas and um, you know use them in what if scenarios you know what if we employed a different way of doing things how would it act I think um, that could be a vision for the future as well is how can we really do better at becoming digital twins that people can use for wind energy. Okay, as we're coming toward the end of this, Shannon, do you have any um, closing comments? Not that I haven't already shared, Sue. I, I think that um, I'm just very impressed by the, by the presentations over the past two days um, and the exchange. Uh, there he is, Dr. Robinson, uh, with camera on. Um, so uh, I just think that, and, and the exchange between the, the audience, I mean, these are all very valuable uh, um, uh, points of view that we want to incorporate and think about. Um, MMC is not going away. It's going to be uh, very visible in these projects that are coming forward. The, this team is, will be participating. So um, I know that some of the users that want to use some of the MMC tools may be daunted by, well, why should I adopt them? If they, uh, we're, we're hoping that, as, as Elliot said, that this will be uh, something that's going to be ongoing, that we're going to continue to sustain and feed those, those notebooks and those, those uh, 
um, those uh, repositories and update them with new uh, re with new capabilities. So um, I think you should stay tuned for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Shannon. Um, Mike Robinson, we'd love to hear your thoughts. You turned your camera on. Yeah, just a couple of um, ideas. First of all, as the phase one portion of the A2E program begins to wind down here, and all the excellent efforts the MMC program initiative, um, I have found that the productivity and the accomplishments of this team over the last several years um, have, have no rival, even within the A2E initiative. They simply have, have been both outstanding and exemplary and superb. I don't know how else to really phrase it. And I really look forward to continuing to help support Shannon as we move into phase two with, if you recall back to what Mike Derby said, a whole bunch of new challenges in terms of deployment. And I look at the atmospheric sciences research requirement, uh, doing nothing but geometrically expanding as we have to move into operational forecasting, the prediction of wind power, both land-based and offshore, and this criteria for land-based deployment increasing six to 11 times. Um, and what that will mean in terms of all the operational requirements to maintain a strategic grid, 100% uh, renewables to you know, maintain the electricity system that we have in a reliability and robust system. There is just a tremendous amount of work that remains to be done. And so when I look when I look down the road, um, I see nothing but an expansion need and the expertise of this esteemed body going forward over the next five to ten years. So thank you for your many contributions and a special thanks to you, Sue, for um, picking up the leadership role and managing the team for us for the last seven or eight years. So thank you. Well, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you to the entire team. I think we've been so successful because we really have a team that enjoys their research, um, that likes working together, that likes each other, that is very collegial, and have really had fun making progress and discussing issues and listening to each other and trying to take the best next steps. So I want to thank the entire team, those of you who gave talks over the last two days, those of you who provided the background for the talks, who, who didn't speak necessarily, but were critical to the work that has happened over the last six years. Um, I think we've made a lot of progress. We've enjoyed it. We look forward to next steps through the new projects and working with the new PIs that we have coming forward. So um, with that, I think we're ready to close this symposium. And we have several papers that the team continues to work on and, and clean up before the end of the project. A few probably won't come out until after the end of the project, but uh, you know, it, it's really been a great um, time forward and enjoyed working with such a wonderful team. So thanks to everyone and goodbye and uh, I'll see team members in two weeks at our usual meeting time. <laughs>